Control Houston continuing to watch a sequential still video now looking at where the space shuttle's robotic arm latches into the the sill of uh, Discovery's payload bay. Mission Specialist Sandy Thomas and Charlie Camarda already underway with powering up that system and moving through the final checkout procedure of the uh, RMS as it's called, Remote Manipulator System. As you look at this uh, sequential still video through the uh, orbiter's S-band communication system, uh, right around the middle of your picture, uh, there's the grapple fixture uh, for the uh, external stowage platform. That's a large tool storage platform that will be attached to the Quest airlock of the International Space Station on the third and final spacewalk of the mission to be conducted by Soichi Noguchi and Steve Robinson. Behind that, the barrel-shaped object is the Raffaello multi-purpose logistics module, the cargo module near the rear of the, car of the payload bay that is equipped uh, with about uh, 15 tons of uh, food and water and supplies as well as experiment hardware for the uh, crew on board the International Space Station, Commander Sergei Krikalov and NASA Flight Engineer and Science Officer John Phillips, who are tidying up the station today in preparation for the arrival of their first visitors since they themselves arrived on the International Space Station back in mid-April. Once uh, the shuttle's robotic arm grapples and unberths uh, the orbiter boom sensor system and brings it to what is known as a high hover position over the payload bay, then the uh, shuttle's KU band communications antenna will be unfurled. Typically, that antenna, which provides high data rate uh, telemetry and uh, television from the shuttle, is deployed on the first day of the mission at right after launch. But uh, because of some concerns over uh, possible clearance and interference issues, very tight clearances between the end of the boom itself and the KU band antenna, uh, flight controllers uh, and mission managers crafted a flight plan uh, to play it safe very conservatively to get the boom out of the way first before the KU band antenna would be deployed. Once it is deployed and we have a high data rate telemetry capability, the imagery that was taken from the external tank umbilical well cameras in the belly of the orbiter yesterday following launch, uh, following the external tank uh, jettisoning and separation by the orbiter from the tank, uh, that imagery will then be downlinked uh, as a Another set of images uh, for the imagery assessment team to analyze uh, in its uh, ongoing deliberations for the mission management team. The order of business, however, today is focused on uh, the first ever inspection of the shuttle's uh, wing leading edge panels of reinforced carbon carbon that is soon to get underway uh, through the use of a new orbiter boom sensor system.
the the 50 foot long boom extension, which was grappled uh, earlier this morning by Andy Thomas uh, using the shuttle's robotic arm uh, to latch onto an electrical grapple fixture at the end of the boom, uh, will be employed shortly, as you see in this animation, to sweep along the 22 panels on the wing leading edge. First, the starboard wing of the shuttle uh, in a back and forth pattern, a pre-programmed automated commanded pattern uh, loaded into the boom software system that will enable the boom to capture uh, 2D and 3D resolution uh, of each of the six so-called zones along the curvature, the convex curvature of the leading edges of the wings. Uh, each wing is expected to take about 90 minutes to survey. The survey to be conducted with the laser dynamic range imager. This uh, is was built by the Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, it's essentially a, a fixed iris, fixed resolution, 20 degree field of view uh, laser sensor uh, that will be used uh, to downlink uh, the data in the form of video. It is uh, fixed at the end of the boom on a pan and tilt unit along with an intensified television camera so to provide, again, uh, 2D and three-dimensional views uh, to create a mosaic portrait of uh, the 22 uh, wing leading edge panels. Once the starboard wing survey is complete, the uh, robotic arm and its boom extension will be maneuvered out in front of the orbiter to take a self-portrait of the orbiter's nose, moving back and forth in a zigzag pattern that will also take about 90 minutes to complete uh, to survey the reinforced carbon-carbon along the nose of the orbiter. Uh, following that, Andy Thomas, Charlie Camarda, and Jim Kelly each taking turns uh, with the shuttle's robotic arm from the aft flight deck uh, control panel on Discovery will maneuver the boom sensor system extension uh, along the port wing uh, to to complete uh, a day-long survey and the acquisition of imagery for the imagery analyst experts here at the Johnson Space Center to begin their analysis of. There is another uh, laser system called a laser camera system that was built by NEPTEC Industries uh, that is hard mounted on the boom sensor system uh, that provides a different sort of resolution that would be used uh, in the event we require what is known as a stop and stare survey that may be uh, required on flight day four if uh, the mission management team determines that we need to go into a more focused inspection of certain areas of interest of the orbiter once it is docked to the International Space Station. But but the, uh, the focus of, an, of uh, the survey today uh, will be uh, the leading edges of the wings, all 22 panels on each of the wings of the orbiter using the new boom sensor system that is in the process of, of completing its calibration at this moment. The robotics officer here in the shuttle flight control room reports that uh, mission specialist Andy Thomas is now poised directly above the electrical flight grapple fixture at the end of the orbiter boom sensor system on the uh, starboard sill of Discovery's payload bay, and we're standing by for the actual motion of the uh, end effector to reach out and grab uh, that grapple fixture uh, in the first uh, step on the road to unberthing the boom and creating a 100-foot-long crane. Houston Discovery for PDRS, no need to respond, we're going into the grapple. It has now been grappled, 2.25 a.m. Central Time. The uh, robotics officer here in the shuttle flight control room reporting uh, a good grapple. So uh, we now have a, uh, a hard fix uh, between the end effector on the uh, shuttle's robotic arm with the 50-foot-long boom extension. You're now looking at uh, sequential still video on the flight deck uh, of Discovery, on the aft flight deck, uh, as Andy Thomas uh, in the uh, center of your picture, and Soichi Noguchi on the right, Charlie Kamarda on the left. You see now uh, a better look at uh, Andy Thomas uh, with Steve Robinson in the middle and uh, Noguchi on the right. Yes, Steve, we're on the bottom of page 1-5. We did the uh, retention latch release on the starboard side. You're probably looking at the same thing we are. The uh, aft end of the OBSS definitely came out of the pedestals. Uh, it was fine, no no bad motion or anything. But we've lost the readies, which makes sense, but we have a zero for one of the release micro switches on the aft. At Discover Houston. And just to clarify, we expect to have no readies on the aft because it came far enough out of the pedestal. We would expect not to have the readies. What we did not expect was not having both releases on the aft. We've got the 8 out of the B.
Hi, Discover Houston. Uh, thanks for those words, uh, Vegas. Uh, we saw the same thing uh, you saw, and we concur with your words. Uh, let us look at it for just a second, and then we'll give you a go to proceed. Top of hold on top of page uh, one dash six. This is Mission Control Houston, again looking at uh, views of the orbiter boom sensor system as it is uh, now poised above the payload bay of Discovery in uh, what is known as the high hover position. Uh, those uh, views uh, through the sequential still video system, uh, it's a frame-by-frame -frame refresher system uh, that operates through the S-band communication system on the orbiter as we await the uh, deployment and activation of the KU-band communication system, which will provide uh, downlink television and high data rate telemetry uh, for the uh, orbiter for the remainder of the flight. And Houston Discovery for KU, uh, KU antenna is deployed and moving on to the activation. We copy. Thanks for the uh, status, Switchy. Houston Discovery for KU. KU activation is complete. We copy, Switchy. Thanks. And there's our first television views of this mission through the KU band communications antenna. This view from the uh, camera at the rear of Discovery's cargo bay, looking to the forward portion of the cargo bay, uh, you're looking at the Raffaello multi-purpose logistics module on the lower left-hand portion of your screen. Uh, the uh, shuttle's robotic arm grappled uh, onto the orbiter boom sensor system, hovering over the starboard sill of the payload bay. So about seven hours today, uh, the crew, uh, led by Andy Thomas, assisted by Charlie Camarda and uh, Jim Kelly, will use uh, the uh, robotic arm, the shuttle's robotic arm, and now attached to it, the uh, orbiter, orbiter, orbiter boom sensor system uh, to collect uh, a 3D portrait of the leading edges of the wings uh, to see if any damage was occurred to those wings during Discovery's climb to orbit yesterday. And with that, uh, the survey of the starboard wing leading edge panels of Discovery has now gotten underway. Uh, the crew uh, deciding uh, for conservation of time to begin with panel number one, uh, which is uh, the inboard panel along the fuselage and then move outboard toward the end of the wing. This is the first uh, of about a 90-minute procedure sweeping back and forth uh, using the laser dynamic range imager. Uh, which is an infrared uh, illuminator and an infrared uh, camera. Uh, the data being downlinked to the ground in the form of video through digital television that is being downlinked uh, from the orbiter. Discovery Houston for... Houston Discovery for LDI. Uh, go ahead, Vegas. Yeah, just to let you know, as expected, the uh, LDRI lasing the uh, wing gave a great illuminator for the RSC camera. Uh, that's great to hear. Thanks for those words. Die Stimme kommt aus dem All. Es ist die Stimme von Crewchefin Eileen Collins, die sich erstmals seit dem spektakulären Aufbruch der Discovery zu Wort meldet. Two, one. And lift off of Space Shuttle Discovery. Ein Bilderbuchstart zu so schien es in den ersten Stunden. Begeisterte Zuschauer konnten bei strahlend blauem Himmel miterleben, wie die Raumfähre in den Himmel schoss. Planmäßig, so schien es, lösten sich zwei Minuten nach dem Abheben die beiden Feststoffantriebsraketen. Doch wie eine am Shuttle installierte Kamera dokumentiert, fiel beim Absprengen eines der beiden Tanks ein Teil ab. Was genau, muss erst geklärt werden. Es gab offenbar noch weitere Zwischenfälle. Doch zunächst sollte nichts die Euphorie über die Rückkehr der USA in die bemannte Raumfahrt trüben. Sich vorzustellen, dass heute endlich wieder Amerikaner fliegen in einem amerikanischen Raumschiff, das ist ein Riesenschritt und es wird nur der erste von vielen sein bei unserer Erforschung des Sonnensystems und bei unseren Reisen zu Mond und Mars. Der Absturz der Columbia vor zweieinhalb Jahren hat ein Trauma hinterlassen. Massiv wurde seitdem an der Sicherheit gearbeitet. So kann die Besatzung heute mit Hilfe eines Roboterarms eine Laserinspektion durchführen. So sollen mögliche Schäden am Shuttle erkannt werden. Denn die US-Regierung hat Großes vor, wie der Präsident Anfang 2004 vollmundig verkündet hat. 
Nicht nur will man alle internationalen Verpflichtungen in Bezug auf die ISS einhalten, sondern auch bis 2008 ein neues Raumschiff entwickeln, das bis 2014 bemannt starten soll. Mit der Erfahrung und dem Wissen, die wir auf dem Mond gewonnen haben, werden wir dann in der Lage sein, die nächsten Schritte der Allerkundung zu unternehmen, menschliche Missionen zum Mars und zu den Welten, die dahinter liegen. Ein Scheitern der Discovery-Mission wäre tragisch und für jemanden, der vor der Weltöffentlichkeit so kühne Visionen entworfen hat, wohl auch eine empfindliche Bloßstellung. Houston, uh, we show you in attitude. Uh, you can pick up uh, with the shoulder yaw in step three of the single joint. Uh, once you're in position, you can go back and pick up uh, step two to do the RCS actions if you'd like. This is Mission Control Houston, an impressive view of the uh, aft portion of the shuttle Discovery, looking out uh, over the uh, starboard wing. Now directly over the vertical tail fin and the orbiter maneuvering system pods. About at the middle of your picture, that dark uh, circular object is control moment gyroscope. That will be replace uh, the failed control moment gyroscope and the Z-1 truss of the International Space Station during the second of the uh, three spacewalks by Soichi Noguchi and Steve Robinson. Right next to the control moment gyroscope is the uh, thermal protection system sample box within which uh, the purposely damaged uh, tile and reinforced carbon-carbon samples are located that Noguchi and Robinson will uh, experiment uh, with a variety of materials and techniques during the beginning of their first spacewalk on Saturday. The uh, payload bay doors opened uh, with the deployed radiators to provide cooling for the orbiter's avionics as we uh, pan over to the port wing of Discovery as the, the uh, Shuttle's robotic arm and the 50-foot-long boom extension are being maneuvered uh, over to the uh, nose cap of the orbiter to begin uh, the survey of the reinforced carbon-carbon of the nose of the orbiter following the completion of the survey of the starboard wing that took about an hour and 45 minutes to complete. This is Mission Control Houston, 21 hours, 43 minutes into the flight of Discovery. The shuttle passing uh, off the southwestern coast of Australia, about to begin a swing over the southern Pacific Ocean in pursuit of the International Space Station on this day of inspection of the orbiter's uh, wings and its nose through the use, for the first time ever, of an orbiter boom sensor system, a 50-foot-long boom extension affixed uh, to the uh, grapple by a grapple fixture to the shuttle's robotic arm to form a 100-foot-long crane that is being used uh, to analyze uh, the reinforced carbon-carbon on, on the leading edges of the uh, 22 panels uh, comprising uh, the two uh, wings, 22 panels for each of the wings of the orbiter, and uh, the reinforced carbon-carbon on the nose. At 4.45 this morning, Andy Thomas, along with Charlie Camarda and Jim Kelly, began the inspection of the starboard wing leading edge panels, all 22 panels. And then, uh, with that having been completed, an hour and 45 minutes later, uh, recalibrated the sensors and now began uh, the inspection of the nose cap that got underway about uh, 15 minutes ago at 7.06 a.m. Central Time directly in front of the orbiter, taking a self-portrait of the nose of the shuttle Discovery as uh, it uh, moves in a zigzag position to cover all of the pertinent areas of interest, uh, ensuring that uh, the nose incurred no damage during Discovery's eight-and-a-half-minute climb to orbit yesterday.
a good view of the, the shuttle and its port wing as uh, the inspection of Discovery uh, enters its final phase for today. There is likely to be additional inspection, more focused inspection of the shuttle on Thursday uh, with the renewed use of the orbiter boom sensor system, which in that case uh, will have been handed off after tomorrow's docking and hatch opening from the um, station robotic arm to the shuttle robotic arm because of an interference created post-docking uh, that between the two uh, docking mechanisms, the orbiter docking system and the forward docking port of the Destiny Laboratory that prevents the shuttle arm from reaching around from the uh, port side of the orbiter to the starboard side. Tomorrow after docking and hatch opening, uh, Wendy Lawrence and Jim Kelly uh, will move from the shuttle to the station and become station robotic operators to use the Canadarm2, the station's robotic arm, to reach around the uh, docking interface uh, between Discovery and the station to grapple onto a midpoint grapple fixture on the 50-foot long boom extension and lift it out of the uh, starboard sill and hand it off to the shuttle robotic arm for further inspection as the mission moves along. Good day and welcome back to the Johnson Space Center for our mission status briefing to take a look at the first 24 hours of Discovery's flight on the STS-114 mission. With us today to discuss all the developments on orbit, the lead flight director for return to flight, Paul Hill. Paul? Morning. I can't tell you how uh, excited I am to be sitting here talking about what we've been doing in orbit for the last 24 hours or so, rather than what we're going to be doing on the day that we finally return to flight. Although most of you have been following what we've been doing for a long time anyway, you probably have the same level of excitement as all of us do. Uh, but needless to say, I'm very excited about where we are, uh, and I couldn't be happier about the status that we've made uh, through the middle or towards the end of flight day two. Um, I don't know that I would have predicted things to have been going as well as they have been just because that's the nature of this complicated business. Um, we captured a lot of new data during asset yesterday, most of it in the form of Im imagery. Through about an hour ago, uh, we have downlinked all of the umbilical well photos of the, the tank during SEP. Uh, we've, we've downlinked all of the summary files from the wing leading edge impact sensor system and about half of the crew handheld photos of the tank uh, during SEP. Uh, we're still looking to downlink the handheld video of the ET uh, sometime later at the end of today or tomorrow if we run out of time today. We captured a lot more data in orbit today. Uh, we have the handheld photos of the Ohms pods that the crew took out there at the aft windows. Uh, we took laser surveys of both wing leading edges and the nose cap using the OBSS, and the port wing leading edge was wrapping up as I was walking over here. So shortly, uh, we should have the OBSS back in the latches and the arm back in a good position for rendezvous tomorrow. Most of the laser data that we took, including on the starboard wing, we brought down in real time, or as the crew inspected, we had about 21 minutes to downlink uh, after we finished up OBSS ops. We'll have all of that on the ground before the crew goes to sleep and in the hands of the imagery analysts. Um, the Elms pod photos also we'll have on the ground sometime today. Uh, they, they could, in fact, be on the ground uh, now as I was walking over here. All the new hardware, all the new flight operations, all have worked extremely well, uh, just like the orbiter has overall. Uh, on top of the new operations, uh, the crew has checked out EDA tools and suits, prepped the docking mechanism and the rendezvous tools for docking tomorrow. They began bagging water for ISS performed an ohms burn uh, to raise our orbit up a little bit closer to ISSs again and prep for rendezvous and docking tomorrow. Tomorrow we dock with the rendezvous pitch maneuver, which will give us great views of the bottom of the vehicle uh, so that we, we can get a real good look at the tile up close. Um, we'll downlink those RPM photos probably before the crew gets out of the shuttle and into the space station. We'll have those on the ground. 
That will finish up our scheduled inspections. And then we'll hand off the OBSS at the end of the day in preparation for the robotic operations on flight day four, both for the PLM and any um, focused inspections we need to do at the end of the day using the OBSS. And like I said, everything's going extremely well. Uh, we could not be more pleased with how well all, all of the new operations, all of the new hardware, and the orbiter itself are performing. And um, with that, I'll take any questions. And Paul, before we take questions, I think we have uh, some brief video clips uh, that you can talk over uh, to discuss, uh, just to review some of the imagery that we saw today. That's right. So we can roll that. Some of you might have seen this already. This is raw footage uh, from the LDRI laser on the end of the OBSS. Shows you exactly what this data looks like when we bring it down as digital video. You can easily make out the RCC panels and individual tiles. This just kind of gives you the bird's eye view of the tail of the orbiter as we are moving from the starboard wing and uh, repositioning the OBSS up to the nose cap. Uh, for the nose cap inspection. And you can tell it gives us, pre gives us pretty good resolution just looking at these types of views. When the imagery analysts process the laser data, however, they can pull out much better resolution than this, and they can see things as fine as quarter-inch penetrations or quarter-inch surface damage, uh, depending on the surface that we're looking at. Uh, all of this, as I said, is performed extremely well. All but about 21 minutes of the data that you just saw is already on the ground. We'll have all of it on the ground here before long. Very good. And with that, we'll take questions starting here in Houston. Please state your name and affiliation, and then we'll go around to the other centers, and we'll start uh, right here in the front row with Todd. Uh, Todd Halverson of Florida today for, obviously, Paul. Um, it, it looked to us, uh, you know, watching over your shoulder this morning, that uh, at least I, as a non-expert, did not see anything that uh, caused any alarm in my mind when I was looking at the inspection uh, imagery. Was there anything we're missing? Uh, did you see anything that uh, might have alarmed you? You know, I, I would say it back to you at the risk of sounding invasive, which isn't how I mean this, but I would say it back to you the same way you put it to me, and that is as a non-expert, uh, watching the video, the short amount of time that I was able to watch the video and not pay attention to what we were doing, I didn't see anything either other than how tremendous the, the resolution was and how good it looked to somebody that didn't really have the process data, which the imagery team will be spending about the next 24 to 36 hours generating for us. But I didn't see anything that stood out. It looked great. And by the way, that's, that's probably a, a good thing for me to, to elaborate on a little bit. We have brought down all kinds of data. I mentioned that when I first started talking. Just like the ascent video yesterday, we have so much more data, so much more imagery now than we are used to having. We have a huge effort going on just distilling all of that information down into actual data. Rather than just raw video, raw pictures, raw laser data, we have a whole team of folks that are turning that into real engineering data for us. Um, and I don't have any engineering reports yet to tell you what that looks like. Looks, what the, the data is going to tell us. Uh, all I can tell you is anecdotal type information. Pictures look darn good. ET sure look good. Orbiter sure look good flying away from the ET itself. And the LDRI data sure look good today. And I expect the RPM photos tomorrow to be the same. I expect that they will water the eyes. And you will almost be able to read the serial numbers on the tiles. They're going to be so good. Like the boom, we're going to sweep back and forth, back and forth across the road. So, Marsha. Um, Marsha, then Associated Press. So, uh, did I hear you correctly, Paul, to say that it'll be flight day before before you pull out the boom to actually use it for inspection again? And is that when you plan to look at the uh, the towel, the chip towel, uh, near the nose, near the land, near the gear door? Is that? Um, we are going to pull the boom back up out of the latches tomorrow after we dock just to get it out of the way so we can pull the MPLM out early on flight day four. The second half of flight day four, we have made time uh, to use the OVSS to go back and scan any areas that we need to scan based on what we saw on flight day one, flight day two, or in the RPM photos tomorrow on flight day three. Um, we have not yet been given a request from the engineering community to take that laser back and look at anything, including things like the small chip that folks are talking about in tile that was seen in the ET video uh, during ascent. Um, there's a team of folks that not only are reducing all the imagery into real data, but a whole separate set of engineers that are looking at, at that data as it becomes available. And those engineers are experts on the TPS. Those folks will tell us if they need more data. Our, our goal was to get good enough 
um, resolution on our first pass, whether it was from ET video uh, or from the lasers or from the RPM photos, so that we wouldn't have to go back and get more data on flight day four, but we're prepared to do it. And flight day four, to answer your question, is the earliest that we would do it. And any more word on the chip tau? Have you heard anything more than what we heard last night? No, as a matter of fact, what I was told when I came on today and at the end of my shift today was the story is the same. Engineering community uh, thinks that this is not going to be a significant issue. They have not yet made a final decision on whether or not they want us to go back and get them higher resolution data. We'll have that in hand sometime uh, late in the cruise day tomorrow, maybe the beginning of the cruise sleep tomorrow, but we'll be prepared to turn it around on flight day four if they want it. Tracy Watson, USA Today for Mr. Hill. I seem to remember that you were going to use LCS for the nose cap. Am I wrong about that? Because you seem to have used LDRI. Um, that's correct, and you know this has been kind of a moving target, especially for the last year, as we as we got more and more data on the criticality of, of damage on the RCC on both the wing leading edges and on the nose cap. Uh, our inspection criteria began shrinking. Uh, and uh, as recently as six to eight weeks ago, we thought that we could use the LCS on the nose cap. Uh, in the short amount of time that it takes to scan the nose cap for, for surface damage, uh, rather than for things as small as cracks. And when we weren't looking for cracks on the nose cap, the LCS was absolutely going to be good enough and a fast enough sensor for us. And we made that decision in early spring because at that time the, the trajectory that we had to use the LDRI laser was going to take us about twice as much time as the LCS was predicted to take. Since that time, two things have changed. One, we went back and, we, and sharpened the pencil on the LDRI procedure and got it back down to about an hour or 45 minutes in order to scan the full nose cap. And secondly, we decided we weren't confident that we, that we weren't really looking for cracks on the nose cap. Maybe a more clear way to say that is we decided we wanted to find smaller damage than the LCS is capable of detecting in the amount of time that we had to use the LCS. The LDRI, on the other hand, is capable of detecting the real small damage in the hour or so that we wanted to spend on it on flight day two. So we made a late decision here in the last month or so to switch back from the LCS to the LDRI. Procedures are, are already published. The crew's been trained on LCS and LDRI both on the wing leading edges and on the nose cap. So it really did just come down to us deciding which is the preferred sensor and how much time does it take and it all fit. To follow up, um, you had some uh, problems with your pan tilt on your LDRI, and I was wondering if, you, if that caused you to miss any data on some of those early passes where you were having trouble on the starboard side. Um, I don't know for a fact that it didn't. Um, we are concerned about that, but because, because we were concerned in general about uh, the angle of incident that we were scanning the full leading edge with, you know, since the, leading, the wing leading edge curves, it's tough to scan all of it at a very precise angle of incident. Um, and because of that, and because we have some very precise goals for the angle of incident we wanted to scan the RCC at, uh, we went back about two months ago and added another pass which gave us a significant amount of overlap. And the area where we first found the pan tilt problems this morning uh, is the area where we have a heck of a lot of overlap already from the scan. So I'm personally not overly concerned. We have the ability to go back and take a look at exactly where we were uh, scanning and look at the video to ensure that we did, in fact, get everything we were looking for. But my, my, my assumption is, based on what we were seeing on the ground, that we got everything and we got everything at the angle of incidence we were looking for. The, the pan tilt problem slowed us down a little bit, and for most of the morning we were about an hour behind schedule, but we caught back up, and as I was coming over here, I think we might have been within 15 minutes of being right on time for the day. Irene, and then we'll go to the other rows. Um, Irene, also with Reuters, I have two questions. Um, the first is, um, you had said in the pre-flight briefings that you expected to see debris um, during accident with all the new um, equipment. And I wanted to know, just uh, based on your initial look at what you've received, if that is what you saw kind of met your expectations, or did you see more or less than what you expected? And the other question is just a clarification on the um, boom, that if there is some additional um, desire by the MMT to look at the nose wheel landing gear door that the boom um, can reach that area, and if there's any other assets or equipment that could be used to look at that um, underside of the shuttle. Thanks. 
Uh, okay, let me start with that one first. Um, we, we can get a pretty good shot of the nose cap just using the Indefector camera on either the shuttle arm or the station arm. If we want to see really, really fine detail, um, better than one inch resolution, then we really need to use the OBSS and get it in close and do a laser scan with the OBSS. But if we can, in fact, get uh, pretty darn close to one inch resolution just using the camera on the end of the arm. But our intent would be, if we're really concerned about damage near the nose cap, we probably would go ahead and send the laser down and have a look. But the engineering community has not yet uh, decided whether or not they need the additional data. Um, what was the first part of the question? I mean, what was the first part of the question? This is, the first part of the question has to do with um, your expectation oh, that's of right. the degree. Sorry, I'm getting old and tired. Um, my expectation. I expected to have more than zero debris. I, I can't tell you that I personally had any specific expectation other than we can't engineer anything to zero. We can't engineer anything to perfection. Uh, so I expected we would shed some small but tolerable amount of debris. And it, it is clear from the ET video alone that we shed some debris going uphill. Um, I also expected, like most folks in our community, we were going to see things that none of us expected to see just because we have never seen what the orbiter looked like at ET set. We've never seen it before. Um, so there were a lot of things associated with that that surprised me, like the fact that you could see the plume of the main engines from that camera and that you could see a vapor cloud at main engine cutoff. I don't think it indicated anything anomalous, but I wasn't expecting it. It came, it came as a surprise. Lisa. Lisa Stark with ABC News. You mentioned in regard to that little chip uh, that we talked about yesterday that uh, engineering thinks this is not going to be a significant issue. Why do they think that? Um, gee, let me tap dance away from this one a little bit. What I, what I tried to tell you is, and again, I'm not trying to be evasive, I just don't want to, to try telling you guys that I know something more than I really know. Um, what I meant to tell you was they have not yet made a decision on whether or not they need more data. The, their first judgments looking at it with the limited amount of data they had was that we weren't going to need more data and it did not look like severe damage. But uh, they have not gotten all the data they're going to get on that damage, like the RPM photography will take tomorrow. So they haven't made that decision. But in general, when, it, when and if a decision is made on any damage site, it will be based on the cross-section of the damage, how deep the damage looks, where it is on the orbiter, uh, both how far forward it is because those areas tend to be hotter and does it happen to be in, a, in an area that has really thin tiles or an area that has low structural margin or low thermal margin. There's a handful of overlapping criteria that depending on where the damage is, it may be an, a relatively simple engineering call to exonerate some damage sites and not need any additional data. Some other ones, if they're on particularly thin tiles or particularly hot areas, the engineering community may want better data so, so that they can uh, have a have finer resolution in their analysis. And we, we should start seeing the jury come in on those decisions by the end of the cruise day tomorrow. And just can you just give us an idea of how many people are going over all this material, the data review team, the in, number of engineers, and are they located all across the country? Can you just give us a sense on how many people are responsible for reviewing all this? You know, I can't tell you how many. Um, you now, it's possible that folks like Terry Murphy in the program office um, have a good head count on how many people are engaged. I need a sense of how large the team is. I mean, there are image analysts at Kennedy Space Center, at Marshall Space Flight Center, and here at JSC who are all involved in reviewing all of the data from main engine start all the way up through the data that we're finishing up taking in orbit right now. Um, there's contractors. Uh, that provided the, the lasers like NEPTEC or like Sandia National Labs that are also helping analyze all that data. And that's all just to take the imagery and turn it into real engineering data. And there's separate teams of experts on aero heating, separate teams of experts on tile and tile damage, RCC and RCC damage that are then going over all of that data to decide whether or not it's adequate to exonerate that damage to come to the ground or whether or not we need to make a repair. At which time there would be a whole another group of folks that would get involved to evaluate different repair methods, how effective they are, what our level of confidence would be in one, one type of repair versus another, depending on where on the vehicle we're talking about. All of that presupposes, of course, we get that far and don't just exonerate all the damage as it is. Charles Hadlock with NBC News. Uh, obviously, there's a need for inspection on this flight, but going forward, uh, will future shuttle missions undergo this type of examination uh, on every flight? 
Um, Let's see, I sure hope not, because this, this has been one hell of a day, uh, one heck of a lot of uh, robotic operations doing these inspections. It worked like a champ, but it is a lot of work, not just for the ground, but also for the crew. The crews had three crew members fully employed doing nothing but this all day long, and when any of the rest of them had a spare moment, they were also there helping them look out the windows, look at camera views. So it's a heck of a lot of work. Now, if this is what we have to do to keep the crew safe and to convince ourselves that we've done the right thing going uphill, then it's absolutely worth that level of effort. Our goal, though, is to demonstrate in a number of ways that it's not required and that we can wait and inspect only if we think that we damaged the vehicle going uphill and we have a reason to worry about it. That's one of the reasons things like the wing leading edge impact sensors are so important to us. If we can demonstrate they're effective, then we could rely on those sensors or the next generation of those sensors to tell us when we take an impact and then based on that cue, go look at the area that we are impact ra rather than using a laser to spend the entire day scanning the entire outside of the vehicle. That's the goal. We'll see, when, we'll see whether or not we get there. We're going to evaluate the data and the progress after STS-121. Uh, Bruce Nichols with the Dallas Morning News. Uh, forgive me, I think this information is out there, but I would like to hear you comment on it. Uh, the laser boom cannot reach the entire underside of the shuttle, correct? And, and since it can't, are we prepared to use the station arm and the boom together if we have to, to do a more complete scan? Okay, first, the, we can take the OVSS sensors to any part of the vehicle we need to scan except the aft compartment and the engine bells. We can get all the way back to the, to the body flap. We can get all the way out to the wing tips. Um, there is no place on the vehicle that we can't reach with the OBSS. I mean, it was specifically sized to give us reach all the way to the body flap for both inspection and repair. Now, there are a few areas that are far out uh, on the starboard wing tip that we can't get the laser sensor closer than about 10 feet. Um, and that's the laser sensor itself. If we were trying to position a crew member for repair, we have methods of getting that crew member all the way up close to get hands on. Um, the fact that we can't get a laser to within about 10 feet in these areas near the wingtip are not a significant issue for us because the resolution that we require in those areas doesn't require us to be closer than 10 feet. So it, for all intents and purposes, we can take the laser anywhere we need, to, we need to take it and inspect at whatever level of resolution is required to see entry critical damage on that surface. That's the good news. Uh, as far as using the SSRMS or the station arm with the OBSS, um, we can pick the OBSS up out of the latches using the station arm, but the station arm end effector, the thing that we use on the arm to pick, pick payloads up with, is different than the end effector on the shuttle arm. Uh, and the difference causes a structural interference problem where we physically can't grab the business end of the OBSS, the end that we grab that's at the far forward location in the latches, that, which is the end that we control the lasers with, it's the end that we flow power to the lasers with. And to make it even harder, the data system and the power system on the station aren't compatible with the laser system, I mean, the, the data system and the power system on shuttle. So even if you could pick it up on that end, you can't just flow station power and data to that laser sensor. <coughs> but it's, it's not required because we're going to fly that shuttle arm on every flight. So we'll always have the opportunity to reach out and grab it with the shuttle arm. John Johnson, Los Angeles Times. Um, just in simple layman's terms, based on the work you've done so far overnight, is it fair to say from what you've been saying that you are less concerned about the chip, the debris, whatever else came up last night that we all talked about, and secondly, um, than you were, and secondly, the, the, do you have anything to give you a sense of how deep the chip in that tile is and how deep those tiles are in that area? Uh, I have I have no data at all on the, the photogrammetrist uh, estimates on how deep that is. It's 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 my guess that they don't have nearly enough data or a resolution in the, in the video they have, in particular from the ED, the ET video, to speculate at the depth of, of that tile damage. We might get a better indication of that with RPM photos, depending on how deep it is and what kind of shadowing we get. Um, we would absolutely be able to see the depth if we take the OBSS down to that location uh, on flight day four. Uh, but I, I haven't seen any data at all speculating uh, at, at the, the depth of that, uh, of that damage. The only thing I've seen was anecdotal and it estimated that, that the damage might be on the order of about an inch across 
but I wouldn't even take that as data because my whole focus in, in um, the last 10 hours or so has been waving the boom around, bringing data down to the ground, uh, and, and I have not been in the rooms analyzing all of the data. Can we then how can we understand the um, engineering team's you know, seeming lack of interest in getting more information? Oh, I, I did not say they, were, they we weren't interested. I said their judgment based on, on the data so far suggests that it's, it's not going to be an issue, but they have not made a final decision. Saying that their early speculation uh, suggests that, that the damage that we have is not a problem is different than saying they're not interested. Uh, and while that might have been their early judgment, they have continued to meet and review the data and, and, and discuss amongst themselves whether or not they're going to request us to go get more data. But they're absolutely interested in exactly what's happened to the bottom of the vehicle. But we have also landed with a whole heck of a lot of damage in the 21 years we've been flying shuttles. And we have a pretty good feel for different classes classes of damage on different parts of the orbiter that we know from flight experience will bring us all the way to the ground. And some damage neatly fits into categories like that. Now, some of that depends on how well you know the depth, uh, both of the damage and the depth of the tile. Uh, and those are things that that engineering community is off discussing right now, and they'll be giving us a final decision on about 24 hours from now. I would also remind you that the mission management team is meeting for the first time since launch at 1 o'clock this afternoon and will be holding a series of post-MMT briefings beginning at 5 o'clock this afternoon throughout the course of the mission with more details on the analysis. Let's go here and take Frank and then we'll go to Kennedy Space Center. Good morning, uh, Eric Berger with the Houston Chronicle. A bit of a philosophical question. You mentioned that the engineering team didn't think that the uh, uh, the chip was, was probably going to be a problem, at least on their initial blush, and that it was interesting last night before the crew went to bed, they were told about these uh, events on the ascent. Uh, the question is, is, has the philosophy of mission control changed? Is the threshold sort of on these events now so low that you'll mention most anything to the crew uh, about possible damage to the uh, thermal protection system, or before the flight did the crew express a willingness to know about anything? that happened? Um, in general terms, our tolerance has not changed. If, if there's something going on with the vehicle, then we like to tell the crew that there's something going on with the vehicle that they're living on and relying to keep them alive and, and relying on to bring them back to the ground. Um, and TPS damage is no different than computer failures or anything else. Our intent is never to hide the state of the vehicle from the crew. Um, it is, has our has our threshold changed for TPS damage since SCS 107? You bet it has. Um, there are there are some things that that we are significantly smarter on today than we were two and a half years ago, and that rightly adjusted our threshold. Um, and I don't know how we could be any, in any different place since we all know TPS damage cost the lives of the last crew. Frank Boring with Aviation Week. Given that the um, inspections you all have done today were very carefully choreographed. Could you explain uh, the work that would be necessary to to actually get to any target for a more focused inspection like that chip tile? Sure. You know, the hard part of that, actually after the, the really hard part of evaluating all the imagery and the engineering data and deciding we have sites that we need more data on, uh, is once we know where those sites are, building the, the robotic trajectories that are necessary to then move this big boom and the laser into place and to put the laser at the right range, right, right angle of incident from whatever surface we're trying to scan uh, and bring the data down. And just doing the number crunching to put the arm in the right place, which puts this boom 50 feet away and this laser 50 feet away in exactly the right spot to give us detailed data on the right spot. Um, that's something that's pretty complicated, but that's also something that in the last year or so, uh, the smart folks like Dave Melendrez and Michael Wright in the PDRS world here at JSC have turned into a real science. Uh, and they have demonstrated in a number of sins how, how effective the teams are at finding those spots and then within 12 hours or less being able to turn those around and uplink procedures to the crew that are ready to execute, ready for the crew to take this boom and stick it under the vehicle where they can't look out the window and see it anymore and bring the data down. We've demonstrated that several times to, to assure ourselves that we're ready to do that in a hurry on flight day three while the crew's asleep and have it ready for the crew to use on flight day four. 
Okay, we'll go down to the Kennedy Space Center now for questions and come back here for follow-ups. Hi, Paul. How do you hear? This is Mark Kirkman of the Interspace News. Uh, two questions for Paul. Um, first, you mentioned uh, you've gotten most, if not all, of the ET photo um, work, both the handheld and the well cameras uh, downlink. Have you been able to look at that and see if the uh, lower PAL ramp was missing on the ET, and did the crew have any observations or comments with regard to that? And the second question is just the mood in the uh, in the flight control room today while you were on shift. For, with y'all finally being in the air after two and a half years, has the mood and the tempo on the flight loop's been noticeably different and so forth? Thank you. Hey, let me ask, answer the, the last question first. Um, I, I would say if there's any difference in the mood in the NCC, it's, um, it's, it's probably that things are somewhat more muted. You know, in my own personal terms, yeah, I was still in the middle of our shift today while we had the arm and the boom out and inspecting the vehicle, um, and I was still in somewhat of a state of shock, almost disbelief that we were in fact uh, talking to a, a real astronaut crew living on a space shuttle in orbit, rather than scratching our heads trying to decide, shucks, when are we going to slip this launch to and when are we really going to get to do this again? You know, it, it has been one hell of a long two and a half year journey for us to get here. And even yesterday, sitting in, in the control center and watching the final count, um, it wasn't until just before we came out of the nine minute hold that it really hit me. By God, we're really going to do this. We are really going to launch this vehicle and throw it into the sky with these seven people sitting on it. Given that, um, the mood in the MCC isn't one that you might, you might speculate it would be. Um, it's not. It's not a real. Um, it's not like a party over there, and everybody is is just elated and bouncing off the walls. Like I said, it is more muted than that. While all of us are adjusting to the idea that we are in fact in orbit again and doing this tough business. And as I walked over here, we were finishing up. Uh, a full day's worth of this choreographed OBSS operations that a year and a half ago, a large part of our community right, right here in the space program thought was not solvable and, and would be impossible. And yet as I walked over here, we had just finished doing it in orbit. And as I said, there's a certain amount of almost shock that we really are here, we really are doing these things that so many folks, not just outside of our community, but even inside the community, thought that we couldn't do, thought they really were impossible, they were problems that we couldn't solve. Um, and that that has affected the mood in the MCC. Um, but we talked about that when my team came on this morning right after the crew woke up. And that is while we recognize there is uh, a certain amount of celebration going on across the country on having space shuttles back in the sky, we've got a real, a real job at hand. We have seven folks living on this space shuttle, counting on us to do the right thing and keep them safe, and not to get all giddy and high-fiving each other, but to keep our eye on the ball and do what we need to do. Now, after we'll stop here in about 12 days, I'm sure there's going to be a little bit more giddiness here at the Johnson Space Center. Um, going back to the other part of your question, uh, lower power ramp. Uh, we do not yet have all the ET photos on the ground. We do have all the umbilical well photos on the ground. I have not heard anything except what the crew reported down that they looked at the umbilical photos last night and, and they were amazed at how good they were. They thought they were just beautiful. I didn't hear anything else on the air grounds on their judgment calls, on the state of the tank or anything else other than then the quality of the photos was really good. I also did not hear anything on the air to grounds or, and I didn't have anything in, in handover notes this morning, uh, about the crew's comments on what they saw in any of the handheld photos, handheld video or anything. I just know that we had on the order of, I think, 97 handheld photographs uh, and we have a, a long string of video that we need to downlink still. Um, there are some folks in the imagery world that have found some things they are, con they are concerned about on the tank. I have, I have not personally been involved in any of the analysis, and I couldn't help make you understand what the imagery folks have seen on the tank at all. They are concerned about some things they've seen uh, on the PAL ramp. 
Um, but I, I would save you asking me any follow-up questions because you'll be frustrated because you now know about as much as I know on the subject. There are some folks that are concerned. The experts are looking at it. They're trying to pull more data out. We'll see what, we'll see what uh, that data is able to tell us here in the next few days. What I personally take real, real confidence in is that the tools we took into orbit with us that we finished using today and then after we have the RPM photos tomorrow will allow us to absolutely know the state of the outside of this orbiter. So whether there's still uncertainty on the ET from umbilical well photos or handheld videos, uh, if we still have that uncertainty in a week, that uncertainty doesn't affect our level of confidence in the orbiter whatsoever. We'll have that nailed down tomorrow, flight day four at the latest. Um, actually, I think that covers your question. Hello, it's Nadia Raval from the BBC. Um, I'm a little bit confused. I'm not an expert uh, by any stretch of the means on, on this. Um, last night, it seemed like the chip tile uh, was a significant issue. And uh, today, Paul, it seems like um, NASA is trying to play this down. Now, I don't understand why this is not seen as a big issue this morning. Um, you said that the engin engineering community, um, that their judgment is that they haven't reached a decision on whether or not to sort of seek more data on this. I don't understand why that is. And um, you talked about past shuttle re-entry um, into uh, back to Earth. Um, when these shuttles have returned to Earth, have you and you've done your post inspection, have any of these past uh, re-entries um, yielded, and when you look at the actual shuttles, have they had the kind of damage uh, to the same area that um, this has apparently caused, that this chip tile has apparently caused near the nose, um, near the landing gear, I should say. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk to you also about a question that was asked last night um, about whether or not it was possible or whether or not you have made a decision to repair this chip tile. Yesterday, um, one of the officials said it was way too premature to talk about repair to this chip tile. Um, is that the same um, uh, sort of prognosis that you're going to deliver today, that it's also way too premature to talk about repair? Thank you. You know, I warned you, you were going to get frustrated if you asked me for more information. Not because I'm trying to be evasive, but I told you every damn thing I know. Let me start with the last part. We are prepared to say that this doesn't, this doesn't need to be repaired. We're not prepared to say that it does need to be repaired. What we are prepared to say is we've seen some things in ET video and some of the other, some of the other imagery that, that causes some concern amongst the experts. The imagery folks, the guys that evaluate the radar, saw things that they thought were indications of debris, in a couple of cases, indications of damage on the vehicle. They, they are doing everything they can to turn that into real engineering data to hand off to smart guys like Dan Bell in the Orbiter Project Office community that can then tell us if, if in fact we have damage, is, is, is the data on that damage already good enough that we can exonerate it based on, like I've already said, flight experience, based on the levels of damage we already know we can land with, if for no other reason because we have landed with. That's the process. Some of those folks' early judgment was that the, the damage looked like it wasn't going to be a significant issue. Yeah, that in no way means they were ready to say it doesn't need to be repaired or it does need to be repaired or it does need additional data or it doesn't need additional data. It means the judgments of the folks that do this for a living and have quantified tile damage that we have landed with in the past, their first blush when they looked at this was it didn't look like it was going to be a significant problem. We're not finished turning the crank inside the community of the folks that do this for a living to have a final decision on whether or not we need more data, whether or not we need a repair. I personally have been involved enough in this particular problem in the last two and a half years that my guess is we're not going to have a problem. But that's just my personal opinion in the absence of having seen any real technical data. And I would suggest that nobody latch on to that this implies that NASA is trying to play this down or anything. This is not unlike any, any problem we ever find in spaceflight. This orbit is an extremely clean vehicle. Um, it, has, it is working like a champ. It is almost flawless. We had a problem with a laptop computer a little while ago, which we are going to spend a lot of time talking about, not because it's a significant issue, but it's all we got.
Everything else is just working too damn well. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this laptop computer. Now, if we had a fuel cell starting to heat up on us, or if we had something that looked like a short circuit in a main bus, then we would stop talking about laptop computers, and we would talk a lot about fuel cells and electrical buses. Now, given all that, then it is safe to say that there are going to be some types of tile damage that are small, like RCG coating chips that are well within our capability to land with because we have landed with them on numerous flights over the last 21 years. There are going to be some of those that we will be able to make a relatively easy judgment call. And that if that's all we have to talk about, it's going to seem awful darn big until we have something else to talk about that clearly is an issue. Chips and RCG coating kind of fit in that category. I'm not saying that that's where we are today, that well, gee, they aren't important anymore because now I have a laptop computer to talk about. But when you hear a story change from one day to the next, it is not necessarily because NASA's decided to play something down. It could be perhaps because we've talked about it long enough and we've seen other data like comparing it to flight history to convince ourselves that maybe this isn't something that we really need to, to be that worried about. Doesn't mean we're going to forget about it. Doesn't mean we're going to sweep it under the rug. But maybe we don't have to all go running out of the building with our hair on fire because it fits within our, our flight experience. That's all I'm trying to get across to you. The engineering community has not yet come back and told us yet that they don't want more data on this. We'll see what they tell us. If they tell me by the end of the day tomorrow or before crew, the crew wakes up the next day they want more data, then by God, we're going to take the OBSS down and we're going to get them more data. Uh, and that data is going to look like they were sitting right there in front of the, the, the tile with their hands on it. It's going to be so good. But we'll see. I'm not trying to play down anything. NASA is certainly not trying to play down anything. It is understandable to me that in our own community, as well in the, uh, as in the public or in the press, that if folks see any TPS damage, even something that is clearly within our capability to land with based on our extensive flight experience, that that's going to get a lot of people's attention and a lot of people are going to tend to overreact to that because as I've already said once and all of you are really uh, very aware of, the last flight ended in catastrophe and we lost seven friends of ours because of TPS damage. So even when we're talking about tile damage that is clearly within capability, that's going to get all of our attention and, and, and all of us are going to get concerned about it. But we don't make decisions in spaceflight based on that type of emotion. We, we make decisions in spaceflight based on the data. And we're looking at the data. And as I said now, I don't know, half a dozen times, by the end of the day tomorrow, I expect that we'll have enough data that the engineering community will tell me if they think they need more data to exonerate any damage, whether it's a tile chip or any other thing that we find in the imagery here in the next day or so of flight operations. Um, Let's see, how does this compare to previous, previous damage? I, I can't tell you. I, I mean, uh, it's not that I won't tell you, but heck, I don't know. As I said when I started, I have not seen the engineering data. I haven't seen any photogrammetric analysis to quantify exactly how big this is. For, for me to tell you how this compares to flight history, I would have to see all of that damage, and somebody like Dan Bell would be the guy to present it to me. He'd also be the same guy to say, well, Paul, here's how this compares to other things we've landed with. Here, here Here's why I either am or am not concerned with um, landing with this damage. Uh, that's where we're at. One more, one more question from KSC. Hi, this is a question for Director Hill, obviously. This is Benno Schmidt. I'm with High Definition News from the Kennedy Space Center. And some of this may be redundant, but I'm wondering, given that you're being very candid about not knowing the extent of the damage just because the analysis hasn't been done yet. I'm wondering how the communication is made to the crew uh, trying to, you know, fully disclose what, what it is that you're looking at and yet not overly alarm them. Obviously, they have a great deal more experience understanding this stuff than, than members of the media, but I'm wondering how the communication is made when you're saying it's still premature to know the extent of the damage and yet you obviously want to keep them uh, fully, fully apprised of what it is at least that you're looking at or at least that your engineers may potentially look at. And I'm wondering again if you could talk a little bit more about their response. Um, I can tell you what we told them at the end of the day yesterday. Um, we haven't talked to them about this today because we've kept them hopping. And as it turns out, it's only here in the last couple of hours that we're getting more data ourselves. 
Um, but at the end of the day yesterday, we did tell them that we saw some indications of debris going uphill that we were going to be taking a look at um, and that we will see what that shows up as in RCC inspection. We'll see what that shows up as, if anything, in RPM photography. Uh, our intent is, as we get smarter, we're going to tell the crew. My guess is, because of what the crew timeline looks like for most of the next four days, we're not going to tell them hourly what the status is on the ground. What we'll probably do is, at the end of the day, as we've gotten uh, demonstrably smarter on what's going on in any of this inspection data or in any other radar or ascent video from, from debris, uh, we'll tell the crew. In the morning when they wake up, if we've gotten smarter again while they were asleep, we'll tell them again when they wake up. Here's what's changed. Here's how much more we know about the vehicle. The intent's not to keep anything from them. The reaction that they had when, when uh, they were told a little bit that we knew yesterday on the air to grounds was, thanks for telling us, keep us informed, see you in the morning. And uh, we're joined by Deputy Shuttle Program Manager Wayne Hill. Wayne? Thank you, Rob. I, I wanted to come over and, and uh, and uh, provide a little bit more light for folks. Uh, Paul, as you know, is the lead flight director and, and having uh, sat in his seat and worn those shoes before, I can tell you that he's a very busy man during the flight with the execution, working with the crew, keeping the, keeping the team, um, the, that is to say the mission control team, uh, focused on what they need to accomplish. He's not uh, the the man that's involved with the offline analysis of all of this data that's coming back. And so um, I want to just uh, apologize to him for, you know, sending you over here to answer all these questions because uh, he's not the right guy uh, because he's got to be focused on the mission. So let me just give you a statement and then perhaps, uh, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can take a few questions on. Frankly, I was trying to get some work done, um, so I'd like to get back to that. Um, we did have a uh, mission management quick look uh, report this morning early. Um, we looked at uh, the, the overnight analysis. Uh, you know, we're still getting a lot of this data down, as you've heard. Uh, there are some things of interest. Um, this flight, we have you know, much, much more information than we've ever had before. And we've seen a whole lot of interesting things uh, on some of these uh, videos. And we're going to be getting more information down today. Uh, more photos will be downlinked. Uh, more film will come back from the from the developing laboratory. And, and we have a team that probably approaches 200 folks pouring over this data. Um, that will provide engineering analysis. Smart people that deal with these uh, tiles, that deal with the uh, with the different aspects of the vehicle, in, in at an engineering level of detail. And we are committed to work through this data, to understand what we've got, and provide you, that is to say, the media and the American people, that information as soon as we come to. Uh, grapple with that uh, information. We've got uh, a couple of little areas uh, that, that John Shannon showed you last night that are of interest. We haven't seen any other big things. Um, and I will tell you that uh, I'll be back this afternoon after the mission management team meeting, after we get the first results of some of this engineering work, back to the management team to tell you all about it. Um, I'm not really going to say a whole lot more then uh, come back this afternoon and uh, and let these guys go on carrying out their mission because uh, we are paying very serious attention to this. This is uh, uh, something that we have spent the last two years preparing for. We have a, I, I would just compare it to where we were on Columbia. Um, you know, a few people looked at the pictures, a few people ran some some small analysis that wasn't grounded in in, uh, in much real science and, and came to the wrong conclusion. This time we have hundreds of people looking at every frame of the video. Management attention is focused on the uh, safety of the shuttle and, and in particular in the capability of the thermal protection system for a safe entry. Um, we have got new tools, analysis tools that are grounded in testing. Um, that have been uh, verified and validated by independent 
uh, organizations, and we are committed to making sure that we come back safely. Um, and, and I think that ought to be obvious to everybody. And so that's, that's uh, all I'll say up front. And I'll, I'll probably entertain a few questions, but don't be surprised if I tell you, wait till this afternoon when I have some more engineering, hard engineering data for you. Let's take a couple. Let's, let's go to Guy Gugliano. Guy Gugliano, Washington Post, um, for Wayne or for uh, Paul. Um, in uh, a couple of months ago, you talked about how you were going to manage this huge amount of data, and I'd just sort of like to ask a process question here. Uh, do you have, uh, are the mechanisms that you put in place to do this, are they sufficient, or are you surprised that you have as much data as you have, and are you getting overwhelmed by it? I'll take that question. The answer is absolutely not being overwhelmed. We are getting the data. We had a very good handle on exactly what we get, and when we when we get it, we have engineers assigned to look at every piece of it, and uh, they're working through it. We're not overwhelmed. It's coming in exactly on schedule, and it's being analyzed to our plan. I'm going to take two more. Okay. Hi, it's John Schwartz, New York Times. This is for uh, uh, Paul Hill and Wayne Hale, or either one, sort of toss-up. Um, with all the data coming in, with round-the-clock cycles, it's a very busy mission, and you're trying to accomplish a tremendous amount. How are you guarding against uh, people getting too tired, the fatigue, affecting judgment, the uh, you know, slip-ups and mistakes that can come inevitably in any busy mission, but especially with this one with so much riding on it? Thanks. Of course, Paul's mission control team has three shifts of operators. They have very strict work rules to make sure that they don't become fatigued, um, and they're following all of that. We have been challenged because we're now trying to apply some of those same kind of rules to our engineering workforce who normally work, you know, normal working hours and, and don't uh, typically work around the clock. But we have set them up. Uh, with shifts in, in a staggered plan to make sure that we have folks available around the clock to continue this work and that they don't get overly fatigued. And again, I hope that this uh, analysis of this data, which will go on for five or six days, will come to a resolution. We will have looked at all of this stuff and we will have come to a resolution on it by about the fifth or sixth day of the flight. And, uh, and so the intense effort then will back down because we will have looked at all the films and even though it, it is kind of intense for the first six days of the flight, um, the engineering workforce will come to an end of their work and they can, uh, they can then stand down. But we have thought a real, uh, an awful lot about how to keep people from becoming too fatigued and when to send them home and um, that's part of the plan as well. Okay, um, to uh, Kelly Young with New Scientists, first for Wayne. Um, I didn't quite understand you. Did you say you have or have not seen other big things? And then quickly for Paul, um, earlier before, before the mission, it sounded like uh, folks were a little bit concerned about clearance with the OBSS, and I was wondering if that was an issue at all. I, I'm going to come back this afternoon and I'll have pictures and with red circles and pointy arrows and we'll talk about all the stuff we've seen. And I'd like to defer that until I have those pictures. Rather than paint a word picture now, which may not be accurate, I'd like to come back with the real show and tell and, and we can show you then. So I'm, I'm going to defer my part of that. On the OBSS clearance, uh, you, we, we were concerned for uh, the last part of the spring, the clearance between the KU dish uh, on the front part of the starboard sill and the forward edge of the OBSS as it sits in the latches, but uh, also on the starboard sill. Uh, that clearance, when you stack up all the worst case tolerances and, and some very unrealistic and overly conservative, arguably, thermal analysis could be very small, where small is on the order of half an inch, maybe even a little bit smaller. That got some of our attention. We were concerned that if we were predicting the clearances were that small, maybe we ought to take a little bit more effort to make sure we don't, we don't uh, run the KU dish into the OBSS when we deploy the KU. That's why we delayed the KU deploy until today instead of doing it last night when we would prefer to have deployed it, which would have allowed us to do things like bring down ET handheld photos 
photos, you can do local well photos last night instead of waiting until today. Instead, we hurried up and pulled the arm up yesterday, put the end effector and the elbow camera across the payload bay to get a really good close-up and high-resolution video of the OBSS in the launch position and the KU in the launch position. Today, when we deployed the KU, before we did it, we reached across and pulled the OBSS up out of the latches, which gave us additional clearance for that KU deployment. And we put that elbow camera in exactly the same place we had it in yesterday and deployed the KU. Over the next several days, our imagery experts, the same ones that right now are awful busy looking at inspection data, are going to look at that data and they're going to put it together for us and show us how close the dish would have come to the OBSS had we swung the KU out with the OBSS still in the latches. We expect to have that answer back uh, before we undock from station. And that will set us up both to put the OBSS down at the end of this mission before we're ready to stow the KU, and it sets us up on STS-121 and later flights to just deploy the KU on flight day one when, when we prefer to and not worry about KU clearance based on the measured clearance that we took in the last two days in flight. Okay, that's it. A couple of programming notes. Uh, coming up shortly, we'll be running on NASA television B-roll video of the flight control teams in action earlier this morning. Wayne will be back, as he said earlier, at about 5 p.m. or thereabouts following the mission management team meeting with his briefing, and that briefing is a staple item every day during the flight from now on. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow morning after docking so Paul can talk about how Discovery arrived at the International Space Station. So we'll see you later. Thanks very much. This is Mission Control Houston, uh, back with uh, ongoing coverage of the activities of the mission following today's mission status briefing with Paul Hill and Wayne Hale. These are live downlink television pictures you're seeing from the end of vector camera on the uh, robotic arm as it has completed its uh, rebirthing over the orbiter boom sensor system and is currently in the process of moving uh, over to its next job, which will be to do a survey of the uh, crew cabin of the Space Shuttle Discovery, uh, looking uh, again for any potential damage. Is there somebody waving? Yes, Julie, that's Charlie and me. Mission Specialist uh, Chella Camarda and Andy Thomas indicating that uh, that's them. You can see waving to the cameras uh, on the uh, Space Shuttle Discovery's robotic arm as uh, they control the robotic arm through a survey of the crew cabin. Again, this is uh, another leg of the inspections that are taking a look at the condition of the heat protection systems on board the Shuttle Discovery following uh, yesterday's 9.39 a.m. Central Time launch and climb into orbit. With that, uh, Orbit 2 Flight Director Tony Sakachi and uh, Spacecraft Communicator Julie Payette uh, giving Andy Thomas uh, and company the go-ahead to begin the survey of the crew cabin, uh, even though they don't have a tape in the deck on board. Sorry for the DTD. Go ahead. Yeah, just to catch up, the, uh, the error message we have, it's uh, the C column 32, I believe it's uh, message 32. And I, uh, looking at the page 12 to 17 on the photo TV checklist, and uh, we managed to get the, uh, the jump tape out, but uh, the error message still exists after the uh, power cycle. So if you would copy that, let, let us look at it. Uh, related to the KU band antenna system, which tracks the tracking data relay satellites that are in orbit, and uh, cable associated with transferring the data from the antenna down into the shuttle systems tends to get uh, wrapped around its pivoting mechanism, and so every so often it has to flip around to clear that uh, from any interference with the cable uh, that would prevent the antenna from being able to track the satellite. The end effector camera taking a look at the uh, forward section of the uh, thermal protection system uh, near the uh, reaction control system jets at the forward section of the crew cabin, uh, moving back along the starboard side of the crew cabin. The previous view was from the elbow camera on the arm looking down at the 
aft flight deck windows uh, that are the overhead windows. Go ahead. Yeah, we completed the uh, email checkout of all emails at this time. So, Ichi, we copy and concur. Four good suits. Excellent news. Well done. Thank you. And uh, one uh, small note is uh, on the SOP check on uh, suit 3010, uh, that's critical of suit, the step 60. Inter, uh, interstage gauge was uh, 4,000 as uh, initially informed by the ground. So uh, that, that is one note, uh, 4,000. And when it press, the, the override button goes out to 400. Copy it. Copy all your notes, Soichi. Thank you. That's good news. Hey, just one last check as we uh, close out the procedure. On step 93, can you confirm that the circuit breakers are main Charlie, main Charlie circuit breakers, step 93? Okay, uh, yeah, that was my bad. Okay, your main, I want to close the uh, main Charlie at this time. And you can open the main Bravo circuit breakers. as they are preparing to move over into the final position to survey the port side of the crew cabin to the left side of it. That's part of the continuing effort to document the condition of the heat protection systems on board Discovery. Houston Discovery for PDRS. Are you going to have any more um, operations for us tonight? We're at the pre cradle position. Andy, we concur, and uh, let me tell you that everybody here is uh, very impressed and very appreciative of the absolutely awesome work uh, you and Charlie have done today with the arm. It's been, uh, it's been very nicely done, and uh, you guys are in a good config for rendezvous tomorrow. So, uh, no, you're done. Again, beautiful job. Okay, well, uh, thanks to Dave Melenders, Michael Wright, Jeff Sugar, and everyone who worked on it. They did a great job, and to James Tinch for uh, helping out as well. Uh, they're the ones that really made it possible, so thanks to all of them. 
Die Discovery-Astronauten haben damit begonnen, mögliche Schäden am Rumpf der Raumfähre zu untersuchen. Ersten Erkenntnissen zufolge soll es nach Angaben der US-Raumfahrtbehörde kein ernsthaftes Sicherheitsproblem geben. Die ausführliche Analyse der Daten dürfte aber wohl noch mehrere Tage in Anspruch nehmen. Millimeter für Millimeter scannt der mit einem Laser bestückte Roboterarm die Außenverkleidung der Discovery ab. Auf der Suche nach möglichen Beschädigungen am Hitzeschild der Raumfähre. Astronaut Andy Thomas bedient die Fernsteuerung. Die siebenstündige Untersuchung ist von enormer Bedeutung. Denn sollte die Isolierung nennenswert beschädigt sein, steckt die siebenköpfige Besatzung in ernsthaften Schwierigkeiten. Und das ist der Grund für die Besorgnis. Kurz nach dem Start löst sich ein Teil vom großen Außentank, schleudert bedenklich nahe am Shuttle vorbei. Schlimmer noch, kurz darauf löst sich auch noch eine Hitzeschildkachel in der Nähe des Fahrgestells. Doch bei einer Pressekonferenz beruhigt NASA-Sprecher Paul Hill. Ich habe mir diese Bilder genau angeschaut und nichts gesehen, was mich hätte in Aufregung versetzen können. Doch die Lage im NASA-Kontrollzentrum war zunächst angespannt. Ist doch der Hitzeschild das vielleicht wichtigste Bauteil im Sicherheitspaket eines Shuttles. Beim Wiedereintritt in die Erdatmosphäre schützt es vor den enormen Reibungstemperaturen von bis zu 1600 Grad Celsius. Die Achillesferse der Schutzverkleidung sind die Nase des Shuttles und die Vorderkanten der Tragflächen. Beim Absturz der Columbia waren 2003 eben diese Teile beschädigt. In der Nacht will die NASA das Video aus dem All Bild für Bild auswerten. Auch die Raumstation ISS wird aus 10.000 Kilometern Entfernung einen Blick auf die Discovery werfen. Noch sieht es nicht so aus, als müsste sich die NASA Gedanken über einen Notfallplan machen. Im Falle des Falles gibt es aber verschiedene Möglichkeiten. Und dazu gehört, dass man mit dem anderen Shuttle, das bereitsteht, Atlantis, das jetzt äh, in diesen Stunden praktisch auf den Launchpad, wie wir sagen, äh, gebracht wird, dann zur Raumstation fliegt und äh, sozusagen eine Rettungsaktion einleitet. Der japanische Astronaut Noguchi und der Amerikaner Robinson testeten bereits die Ausrüstung für den Weltraumspaziergang. Bei den drei geplanten Ausstiegen sollen Techniken für die Reparatur des Hitzeschildes im Weltall erst... NASA officials say so far it doesn't appear that a chipped tile on the space shuttle Discovery is a serious problem. Engineers haven't decided whether to ask NASA to use new lasers and cameras to examine the belly of the shuttle to gather more data on the tile that chipped off during launch on Tuesday. Astronauts were already scheduled to use the equipment to take a close look at the shuttle's wings and nose. And I'll be back in two minutes with a look at the headlines for you after that. Stand by for World Sport. You're watching CNN. Discovery hat mit der Suche nach Beschädigungen begonnen, nachdem gestern in der Startphase außen ein Stück der Schutzhaut abgeplatzt war. Vor zweieinhalb Jahren war das beschädigte Hitzeschild Ursache für die Columbia-Katastrophe. Beim Landeanflug waren alle sieben Astronauten ums Leben gekommen. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Mission Management Team briefing. This follows the uh, Flight Day 2 Mission Management Team meeting uh, for the STS-114 mission. Uh, I'll introduce the two participants. They'll each have some opening comments, and then we'll take questions. Uh, to my left is Bill Parsons. He is the Space Shuttle Program Manager. And to his left is the Deputy Manager of the Space Shuttle Program, also serving as the Chair of the Mission Management Team, Wayne Hale. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Well, good afternoon. First, uh, let me say that on-orbit operations continue to go extremely well and, uh, and as planned. I wanted to go ahead and uh, just right up front address um, an unexpected debris uh, issue that we had. And, and I'll just uh, give you a, a, a little brief on it, and then Wayne will go into some more details for you. Uh, first of all, uh, we had a debris event on a What, I, what we call the PAL ramp, which is the protuberance air load ramp. And uh, on this model, you can see it's along here, along the LOX feed line. And the area where we had the uh, debris event was uh, a little ways down from the, uh, from the, the where the, LOC, the LH2 uh, ramp 
begins about the third, uh, I guess that's a, I don't know what, ice frost ramp right there, right. Okay, so that's about the area we're talking about, and Wayne will show you some pictures of that a little bit later. What I wanted to, to let you know is uh, our expectations when we went into uh, this flight that we wouldn't have an unexpected debris event. Uh, the program throughout the last two and a half years, we've reviewed uh, many areas on this tank and ways that we can improve that. Uh, the, the PAL ramp was one of those areas that we reviewed, whether we should uh, make modifications to that or whether we had enough technical data that we felt it was, uh, it was okay to fly as is. We did remove a portion of the PAL ramp around the, uh, at the very top of this ramp right here around the uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm speaking. <laughs> well, right, right, at, right at the very top of the uh, the, uh, the lock speed line. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> we removed that so that we could make some modifications underneath the PAL ramp, which we were concerned about in the inner tank flange area here. And then we put that ramp back on, but that was at, at the very top. When the program reviewed this, and I was the, the chairman at the time of the, of the Program Requirements Control Board, we brought forth all the technical data regarding this PAL ramp. And there were some concerns about this ramp. It is a large piece of foam. And so uh, the community was, uh, was very diligent about looking at this. Uh, we did realize that eventually one day we needed to put together a program to, to remove this PAL ramp at a fall possible, but at the time we did not have enough data to where we could technically do that and be safe. So we started looking at the data that we had. In the end, we came away with, uh, we had enough data that showed this was uh, a very, um, we have had very few problems with the PAL ramp and, uh, and that we decided that it was safe to fly as is. Obviously, with the event that we've had, we were wrong. Um, we had put in place ways to observe this. We were looking for any kind of event like this. We did not expect the PAL ramp to have the issue that it had, but it did. So what that causes for us is a, a step back. We have to take a look. Now, one, one, there are some good things that came out of this. The fact is it didn't cause any damage to the orbiter that we're aware of at this particular time. Looks like we, uh, we did not contact the orbiter at all. But it does cause us pause take a step back and take a look at what we might have to do. We have integrated hazards for the debris environment, and that integrated hazard will now be opened after we get more information. It will be opened, and, and until it's closed, we won't be ready to go fly again. So, I mean, you might as, well, might as well just let that out right now. We'll have to close that integrated hazard. That requires a lot of work, requires a lot of understanding. If we had understood it before we flew, then, then we would have made modifications to it, but apparently there's still more understanding that has to occur. And we will go do that and do it diligently until we're ready, we won't go fly again. Now, I don't know when that might be. So I'll just state that right up front. I, we, we're just in the beginning of this process of understanding. This is a test flight. This was a, a flight that we had to go off and, and try to get as much information as we could and see if the changes that we had made to the tank were sufficient. And again, I will say, obviously, we have some more work to do. And so uh, I just would just leave you with uh, we're going to go do that work. We're going to collect the data. There's still, uh, uh, again, we just have some images that we're, we're starting to review, and we're going to go through that very diligently. We're going to put together uh, an investigation team, and we're going to go through and try to understand the fault tree for, the, for this failure. And then when we do un understand that, we will make the appropriate repairs. Okay? And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Wayne. Thanks, Bill. Um, you know, we really have a two-pronged approach here. Uh, we have what we need to do to ensure that this flight, STS-114, is safe, and then we have what we're going to do to get ready for the next flight uh, on down the road. And, and I think we're dividing here a little bit. Uh, the program has work to do, which will be done in the normal course of business to be prepared for the next flight. Um, the focus that the mission management team has clearly is to ensure that this flight is safe and that we have a good uh, system to bring the uh, discovery folks home with. 
To that end, we set out early on to say that we needed to inspect the thermal protection system of the orbiter thoroughly before we would commit to an entry. And uh, tomorrow, as the uh, shuttle crew flies up to the International Space Station, we're going to use one of those primary techniques, which is um, to take pictures of the bottom of the space shuttle from a distance of about 600 feet from the International Space Station with very um, high magnification lenses and uh, downlink those digital still images to the ground where the engineers can look very closely at all the tiles in the thermal protection system. Um, also, we uh, have today done the uh, survey with the uh, orbiter boom sensor system of all the wing leading edge um, um, RCC panels and the nose cap um, to make sure that they are in good shape. And all of that has been going very well. Those are our primary methods to clear the thermal protection system of the orbiter to prove that it's safe to come home uh, on this flight. Um, all of the other pictures that we've got, from the ground cameras, the airborne assets in the WB-57, the uh, onboard cameras and at the external tank uh, camera that we that were so dramatic uh, and, and beautiful during launch day, and the uh, cameras that are in the solid rocket boosters, which are being towed back to uh, Port Canaveral, and we'll have those uh, tomorrow um, in hand. Uh, all of those pictures are to provide us engineering information. We knew from the very start, and if you'll go back to the press briefings we gave several months ago, those were not the primary means to clear the uh, underside of the orbiter to ensure that the thermal protection system was in good shape. No, it's the, the inspection that's being done through these uh, still photographs from the International Space Station and the boom sensor system uh, scan. Those are our primary means to uh, understand what we got uh, in terms of the immediate flight safety. We did want to have these other assets in place to gather engineering data so that we would understand how well our fixes worked on the external tank and other items of interest. And I have to tell you that they have performed far exceeding our expectations. Um, the external tank uh, camera that, that we all watched uh, the other day um, is just a remarkable development. A small little camera put together in a very short amount of time with a uh, radio downlink to our tracking stations on the East Coast uh, uh, just performed in an outstanding manner. And normally I would have not thought we would be here talking to you about those kind of uh, uh, the kind of things that we're going to show you in just a minute um, because I didn't expect it to perform that well. It has exceeded our expectations. Similarly, the digital camera that's in the umbilical well of the orbiter that took pictures of the tank and so we separated from it uh, has exceeded our expectations. So we have um, better data than I had possibly hoped to show you. So I think well, what we are is we are in, in a learning uh, part of the uh, part of the curve here and, and we're, we're seeing things that we have never seen before. Um, Bill Reedy, the uh, Associate Administrator for uh, Space Flight, said that um, uh, if we had have had this data on STS 1, 2, 3, and 4, if we had have had the technology and the capability to gather this in the early flights, it would have been a marvelous thing. Here we are 20 years later with updates. Um, and the technology and the kind of sensors that we have today, we're gathering data that we wish we had have had 20 years ago. And it's a, and it's a really great effort, and I'm really proud of it. Uh, when we started this uh, journey a couple of years ago, we had uh, a number of management experts come in and, and talk to us about different things. And, and um, frequently we would have management meetings and people would come in and say, I've got good news and I've got bad news. And the management experts said, quit saying that. Uh, because uh, it inhibits people from bringing you the, quote, bad news. And as managers, you need all the news. You need all the news. You need to get accurate information as quickly as possible so you can set forward a good plan. So in our program, we no longer say good news or bad news. We just have news. And then we deal with that news. And I think that's one of the little techniques that we've instituted very well. So I have news today. And, uh, and some of it I, I think I talked about the really good part, and then I have some other news that we're going to talk about, and without putting a value judgment on it, it's 
information that we needed to know, and it's information that we're going to go deal with to ensure safe space flight in the future. So let's go to the pictures. I want to go through some of these. This again is a, uh, a, a double picture kind of on the top right is a still frame out of the um, ET uh, LOX speed line camera that we watched uh, the other day. And in the lower left is an inset that I'm going to talk about um, which was taken on the ground before we launched. Now you'll see there are three items that are pointed out here on this particular frame. Um, first is uh, a little white speck at the aft edge of the right nose landing gear door. Um, that white speck appeared and we saw the piece fly away from it, piece of orbiter tile which uh, is in flight, captured in mid-flight there, uh, kind of in the middle of these three arrows. So we clearly saw a piece come off that tile and fly away. This is outstanding resolution and for this little camera that downlinks 30 frames a second, the fact that we captured this from a time standpoint is just phenomenal. Now, out, outboard of those two arrows, you'll see another picture in the what we call the chime, the forward curve portion of the uh, orbiter's lower surface. Um, that is, stands for area of interest. There's a little white speck there. Um, again, when we get the rendezvous pitch maneuver pictures tomorrow from the International Space Station, we will have even better pictures, not only of these two little areas, um, but of the whole undersurface of the orbiter that we will begin to make some engineering judgments on. Just as an item of interest in the baseline image, you can see the bipod uh, there can in the lower right. Uh, this picture was taken on the ground before launch and you can see that the gear doors, the left hand uh, gear door and then the right hand gear door in a, in a, they're reversed. Okay, obviously we're looking at this from the bottom. so. So the right hand door is on the left, if you understand that. At the, the very bottom right hand corner of the left most tile, you can see a little open off. That corner was broken during ground handling. This is not uncommon with the tiles that are right up next to the seal of the door, right up next to the edge of the door. And that was repaired using a standard tile repair technique. Whether or not that repair has anything to do with the piece coming off is unknown at this time. Okay? But it is of interest. So we are gathering this data. Um, the folks have gone off and looked at the history of these tiles. They know they provided us a map of the tiles and annotations of which ones have been repaired and how many times they've flown and all the pertinent data. And obviously we're going to look at that very closely and they are already beginning to work on that. Could I have the next picture, please? And when did that, did that repair fly? That repair has come before. No, it's the first time. First time. Okay. first time. The tile has flown at least uh, three times that the repair was new for this flight. Right. Um, this is a little graphic. Um, and again, it's a busy thing because we got two graphics together. On the left, you see the, the big picture of the whole kind of nose of the orbiter uh, showing the gear doors and then a blow up kind of on the right. Uh, showing the uh, tile that um, we apparently have lost a corner off of or a part out of. Um, that was a strengthened tile and um, folks uh, did not see anything that, uh, that would impacted that tile so um, we don't really have a mechanism for why a part of that tile came off. Next slide please. This is showing just a little bit about the nose gear door. This is a cross section um, at, at the top, the outer mold line as we call it is the outside of the vehicle. At the bottom, the inner mold line is the inside of the vehicle where the uh, gear, the nose gear lives. And we're showing a little graphic that shows that there is a pressure seal on the inside as you would expect. Um, then there are two thermal barriers, a primary thermal barrier and an outer mold line thermal barrier. We have redundant thermal barriers around the nose gear, uh, which is something we wish we had around the main landing gear doors and are in fact working on as a future modification. Those tile in that area are 1.8 inches thick. Uh, they are sized principally for the aerodynamic 
uh, shape that it provides the vehicle uh, and are actually thicker than they need to be from the thermal standpoint. Uh, folks, are when we get the um, higher resolution pictures uh, tomorrow, we'll begin to look very hard about these thermal barriers, but I've got to tell you, um, we feel good about having a redundant thermal barrier in this area that's deep down in the tile. So are we concerned about this? We're treating it very seriously. Are we losing sleep over it? Not yet. We're going to continue to do the evaluation. There's another picture, I think a little bit more uh, information that was presented to the mission management team today looking at the uh, tile in particular that we um, we uh, have been talking about uh, the repairs, the sizes, the gaps, um, and in fact, we uh, did not put any gap fillers around this tile because it did not need any gap fillers. And um, a first guess at the mass, which was very small, that came off. So uh, that's, you now have as much data as anybody in the free world does, okay? Um, we are going to continue to look at this. Our plan, we'll get the um, rotation of the rendezvous pitch maneuver pictures tomorrow, as I said, which give, give us much better information about the area that we lost. Um, we probably, although it hasn't finally been decided, probably on flight day four, when we left ourselves three hours for focused inspections to get the boom back out and look at some areas, um, we will probably look at this and get a really good depth reading, and then uh, we will put it to our engineering assessment um, with the entry thermal um, effects to uh, see uh, what the consequences of that uh, will be. We are also building up a mock-up for a, uh, a ground model of the nose gear uh, in this area, the uh, thermal protection system which we can put in the arc jet facility to test and reentry conditions if, if we want to try to duplicate the damage that we see. So that uh, work will be done over the next several days. Next picture, please. Again, uh, this is looking at a tile map, that little white spot, uh, the, the third arrow, if you, if you will remember back to my first picture, this is, uh, this is identifying the tile that we think that little white spot showed up on. We have no dimensions yet. Again, uh, the, the rotation pitch maneuver, rendezvous pitch maneuver, I've got to get the acronym right here, will give us a higher resolution information that we can begin doing some engineering work on in the days following. We have uh, told the uh, space station crew that we are particularly interested in getting good shots of these areas. It was on the plan already. They're going to be especially uh, getting good shots of these areas for us tomorrow. Next picture, please. Um, the big uh, news that everybody's uh, really paying attention to, of course, is this piece that flew off after a solid rocket booster separation. Um, in aerodynamic terms, that's a pretty benign time because there isn't much air to accelerate a uh, piece of uh, foam or whatever it is to high speeds uh, that would cause an impact uh, hazard. In this particular uh, shot, you can see some of the work that the imagery sciences folks have done to estimate the size. Um, I did not get an estimate on the mass, but uh, obviously, uh, given that it's foam, which I'm going to show you a little bit more about in the next couple of pictures, it's bigger than our allowable from this area, so we clearly have got to uh, deal with this for future flights. The good news here is the video pretty clearly shows that it fell away and did not strike the orbiter or uh, anything else. Next slide. Here is a picture that was handheld, I believe. The big picture was uh, released uh, um, earlier, but uh, we've got a little inset where, again, the imagery sciences people are off looking at the uh, hydrogen protuberance air load ramp. Now, remember, the external tank has got two tanks, an oxygen tank at the top pointy end, and a hydrogen tank down at the bottom, and then a, a structural area, the inner tank region, that's got this corrugated look in between the two tanks. Um, running alongside the, the tank are, is a cable tray that carries instrumentation that uh, we need to know about, interesting things like engine cutoff sensors, pressurization measurements, so on and so forth, uh, and also the pressurization lines that feed back the hot gas, well, not so hot, but hot in terms of 
cryogenic temperatures, warm gas back from the main engines to pressurize the tank, a hydrogen line to pressurize the hydrogen tank, an oxygen line that goes up to the very up top of the tank to pressurize the oxygen tank. Those are our, and then of course you see the big 17 inch liquid oxygen line that comes down the side of uh, the tank. Those are our protuberances. Um, we did a lot of work in the wind tunnel early on to see if we could get rid of those ramps because there are large foam areas that we don't want to deal with if we don't have to. The aerodynamics came back that no, they provide important protection from the supersonic shock uh, patterns that set up in the tank um, to those protuberances. They protect the 17-inch line and those pressurization lines in the cable tray. Um, that's very important so we cannot get rid of them, but we have started a longer-term effort that a number of tanks down the road, it may be replaced with a metal ramp that's bolted or welded on uh, rather than a foam ramp, which is, of course, sprayed on. Um, next picture, please. Um, here is a close-up now from the ET umbilical digital still camera, not the handheld, but the digital still camera that was another one of the developments that we put on for the return to flight, which we didn't have before, uh, which was downlinked a little bit earlier today. And the imagery sciences people have outlined the area of interest in black. You can also see little white puck marks over the tank. Those are allowable popcorn that we knew was going to come off, little pieces of foam whose mass is so small that uh, we knew was not a problem. Of course, this uh, piece uh, here is a problem that we're going to have to deal with, not for 114, but for the future. And you can clearly see the cable tray next to the uh, next to the um, orange covered power ramp, the two pressurization lines, and uh, what we call ice frost ramps that, that uh, because uh, we have uh, something obviously has got to hold those two pressurization lines to the metal tank underneath, and that's very cold. We have to insulate that. And the 17-inch uh, liquid oxygen line. Next picture, please. And then, um, that's not all. Um, we saw a couple of divots in areas that, frankly, are not satisfactory to us. Um, we would spent a lot of time working on what we call the liquid hydrogen interface um, ring, LH2 interface, um, right there uh, at, the, at the edge of that corrugated section to make sure that we would not lose pieces of foam. And in fact, we see a, about a six or seven inch uh, piece of foam that came off right there at that interface, that is unsatisfactory, and we've got to work on that. And then there is a divot down in the acreage foam, which we did not expect to see. Um, acreage foam, which is applied by machine, um, uh, by robotic machine, uh, very uniformly, we did not expect to see that kind of divot before. And when did we, we did not make any modifications to the acreage foam. So no, that's, that was... That was, we did not make any modifications to that acreage, acreage foam, so that was areas that we had not made any changes to. And then uh, the intertank flange area is where we had done a lot of work, and, and to be quite honest, it, it performed very well it did. above that. Now, there were a couple of those two areas that are very uh, interesting to us, and we're going to have to go off and do some work on Okay, let's see. I think that was the last picture that I had. Oh, I got one more. Okay. Oh, there's a close up. So that is the same picture that we showed you just a second ago, but it is now close up. And uh, you can actually see, I think in the top area, some green, which is the, the color that the um, aluminum is uh, painted uh, down below the foam. So um, we've got some work to do there. Again, the good news here is that the orbiter discovery appears to be in, in good shape. We have yet to finish our evaluation. We're going to take that slowly and methodically um, to the next four or five days and come up with a uh, fly home as is recommendation or a repair recommendation as required. And uh, that engineering work is going to be done very, very thoroughly and with attention to detail. I've got to remind you that uh, the differences between this flight and the previous flight, we have now got a team that numbers close to 200 people uh, evaluating all of this imagery. Um, the radar uh, that we got um, down, the um, wing leading edge sensors that we got down, the OBSS, orbiter boom sensor system, um, laser 
um, measurements of the uh, reinforced carbon carbon weaning edge. Um, this is done with um, well calibrated models, uh, engineering analysis models that were validated by testing. Uh, we are paying very serious attention to this because it, it's obviously very important. Um, for us to look at these little areas this quick is a bonus in my opinion and we'll see uh, what the uh, RPM photos show us tomorrow. We do think that there are a couple of areas in the aft um, that, uh, that we don't have a good picture of that uh, some folks can't tell, might have been sun glint, might have been another couple of little white spot down on the body flap and down the left and board elevon. Um, so we're also going to take a close look at those in the photos. But again, those photos and the OBSS scans and the engineering analysis are what are going to prove that it's safe to return Discovery uh, home with. I think uh, earlier today you got a really good briefing from the from the lead flight director and the mission ops team on what's going on in flight. Uh, the crew's doing well, and I'm not going to add much else to that. Um, and uh, if you have any more questions about that, I'm sure Paul will be back here tomorrow to talk to you about um, the operations that are going on in the flight. So we're here to talk about the mission management team and, um, and these uh, type issues that we're showing here. So I think I'll quit. And I'll add one more thing. Uh, uh, the orbit project manager, uh, Steve Polis, mentioned today in the MMT, and I was sitting in the back listening, and, and he said uh, the OBSS, the laser systems, and the, and the TV camera, the wing leading edge sensors, and all these uh, imagery assets that we've uh, used uh, have just worked beyond our expectations. So, I mean, we have had some extremely great successes within this mission with some of the additional items that we've added onto this mission. And I, I just would uh, mention that to you that they have really performed quite well. I will add one more thing. I said I was going to quit. But I'll add one more thing. These packages have been uplinked to the crew, so they're available for the crew of both the shuttle and the station crew to look at and ask questions if they have any questions. So, not your turn. Okay. Uh, for these gentlemen, please direct your question also for the uh, microphones. Uh, give your name and affiliation when I call on you. And we've got three centers that have questions, so we're going to try to go through this as quickly as we can and get as many people as we can. Let's start with Mike right there. Mike Cabbage with the Orlando Sentinel. Um, for Bill, talk. I, I realize this is really early, and I know there must be a big sense of disappointment over this, but. Talk about the impact this is likely to have in the next few months. I mean, are you, is it safe to say you guys are done for 2005 to, uh, to look at this problem? What does this mean for the long-term viability of the program? I mean, you guys spent uh, two and a half years and, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars trying to fix the, the foam issue, and it, it's still here. And for Wayne, just a clarification if I could. Is the foam divot that was up near the bipod area, is that actually on the flange area that was redesigned, or is that not on the flange area? Well, first of all, um, you know, th this is a test flight, and we went off to go uh, to take a good look at this vehicle and see how it would perform. And, and unfortunately, it didn't perform as well as we'd like it to have performed. I can't say what the impact of this is until we get some good evaluation of this and, and try to understand what caused this to happen. Um, we are going to go through and, and do a thorough evaluation and then we'll determine when it's safe to fly. Um, obviously, we cannot fly with PAL ramps the size of this ramp coming off the way it, the way it did. I mean, obviously, we have to go fix this and, and that's, uh, you know, if there's things that, it, the program before, had we understood that we had a, an issue, would have gone off and fixed it. Of course, on Columbia, that didn't occur. On this particular flight, this, was, this is talking to us. We've got to go take a look at this, and we have got to go find a solution to this problem. And we will. Um, and I don't know the long-range impact just yet. I, I just think I need to let the team go off and go work this and bring back some recommendations, and uh, then we'll determine what we need to do next. Um, you need to understand, though, right now, this team is focused on STS-114 and, and getting this crew home safely, and that's what we're going we're gonna to concentrate on. And then when that's done, we'll move on to the, to the next part of the, of the program and, and see what we do next. And, and Mike, that was, uh, yes, the, uh, that one divot, and I showed you a couple of different places where we lost boom, but that one divot is at the uh, liquid hydrogen in tank flange. 
and, and that was where we made the design changes to the bipod foam, and right in that area is where a lot of those modifications were made. So there's something there we need to we need to go take a look at. Go ahead, Mark. Tom Rockford from the Houston Chronicle. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One, does this take an SCS 300 off the table if you needed to? And second, could you make some estimate of the mass of the uh, foam piece that was missing in the early image? Mark, I would tell you that I don't have an estimate of the mass, and I, and I, and I wish I had brought one with me. We'll have one for you tomorrow. Um, it, it, right now, looking at what we've seen, we think the need for an SDS-300 is very remote. Um, so we're we're not going to uh, deal with that unless it comes up. Thank you, Mark, from USA Today. For Mr. Hale, uh, I'm wondering if I misheard you or not. I thought you heard, I, I heard you say that you thought it would be safe to bring the vehicle home as is. Did I misunderstand? The uh, one of the uh, one of the decisions that we made at the uh, mission management team today, based on again the experts' very preliminary assessment of what we've seen, is that we've declared that the TPS is not suspect. Now that's. That's a very technical term that goes to some of the flight rules that we have for subsequent failures and what the mission control team ought to do if there is an uh, emergency situation on board the orbiter. So uh, we are going to do a very thorough job before we commit to a normal deorbit. But as of today, um, our thinking is that, that we are not far off uh, being ready to come home if we needed to. We have a whole process that we're going to go through, and, and Wayne's going to, going to, you know, work through that over the next four, five, six days. We got a lot more inspections we're going to do, a lot more examination we're going to do, and uh, and it's good to know right now that we feel very confident about our thermal protection system. But we're going to continue to uh, to do our plan as we've laid it out, and do our observations, and figure out uh, and learn as much as we can. Is that based on the boom inspection you did today of, of the TPS? Is that why you think came to that conclusion? Yes. Uh, Royce, let's get uh, John right there on the way this way. Uh, John Schwartz, the New York Times. Gentlemen, if you could talk about, just briefly, I, I, I know that uh, not everybody does feelings, but, uh, but if you could uh, speak briefly about the sense of yesterday's sense of celebration and what what it felt like today to hit this. I'll, I'll try and then I'll let Wayne give it a shot. Um, you know, it, you don't like to use the word disappointed because we, we like to be optimistic about what we're looking forward to. And this is this was a, a wonderful day when we launched the shuttle uh, yesterday. And I mean, we, you're right. We came away thinking, uh, what a perfect day, what a perfect launch. This was just beautiful. Uh, when we came away from that, um, it, it obviously we I personally am disappointed. Personally, I'm disappointed that we uh, had this happen. But on the other hand, uh, call it luck or whatever. I mean, it didn't harm the orbiter, and we learned something. This whole flight is about learning. And so I, I came away saying, you know, what if what if this had not happened? Okay, but what if this problem existed and, and yet we went and flew for five, six, seven flights and, and it didn't surface itself and maybe we became very comfortable with that, that this was uh, going to be okay and we decided maybe we didn't need to make some changes or whatever. So I'm almost of the opinion that I got to thinking about it and I said I'm glad this occurred, I'm glad that it, it went and did not damage the orbiter and I'm glad that we have an opportunity to go fix this. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that we, when we put our engineering engineers to a task, they go and solve this. We put them to this task, they will solve this too. And, and I think in a, in a lot of ways it's a, it's a very good thing that we got to see this and we get to go off and fix that. You know, that's my, my opinion now. Tom, I, I got to tell you, this is like the question I think you asked me a couple of days ago about the engine cutoff sensors. I mean, are, are you disappointed that things don't run right on schedule and you have uh, problems that you have to solve. We are in the business of flying in space. It's a very difficult business. There are lots of obstacles to flying safely in space, and and uh, the fact that we have some more obstacles, uh, some more work to go do, um, doesn't isn't disheartening. It's just the nature of the business. Um, do I wish that it was perfect? Yes, I wish it was perfect. Um, but that's like saying I wish it would never rain in Florida too. So we deal with it. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm Jim Over with NBC. I'd like to give a second pass for you, for you guys on Mark's question about SDS 300. Considering what you have to do to requalify the ET to fly, can you see any circumstances in any possible schedule where you could fly SCS 300 within the time frame required? Or can you basically, or have you decided to stand down processing for SCS 300? Jim, we have not decided to stand down processing at all. Um, again, I've got to tell you, we think at this time, based on what we're seeing, that the requirement for an SDS 300 is extremely remote. Um, and we're going to, and if that changes, then obviously we're going to have to deal with this. So uh, at this time, uh, we're bringing you data hot off the presses. I mean, there is there's nothing fresher than this, and, and we're, that is out in front of us. We have not decided anything about it. You know, Jim, when, when we decided to do a launch on need vehicle, when we came to this situation, we were very aware that if it was required, it was because things didn't go the way we had planned. And we were quite aware that it would be a most difficult decision to do an, a launch on need after we had an event. Okay, it's, it, it hasn't changed. It will still be a difficult decision. But the fact is, we make a lot of hard decisions in this business, and, and we would be prepared to make that decision if we needed to. What Wayne is telling me is we don't, we don't believe that's going to be necessary. Things look very good on orbit right now. I'm off with Reuters. Um, you have a what looks like a healthy shuttle on the way to the space station, and the prospect that it may be the last one for a while again. And I'm just wondering if you have any um, people working on any uh, changes in the flight plans or anything um, with the prospect of not being able to get back soon that you may be implementing. Well, you know, uh, Irene, we have a very full mission. Uh, we're going to repair the control moment gyros that are giving problems to the International Space Station. We've got a huge load of logistics that we're carrying up. Um, that's all planned to fit into the timeline. Um, we, we did ask today for people to go off and think about what else we might do if it was going to be an extended period of time before the shuttle came again. I really expect very little to come out of that because we have optimized the plan to get the maximum we have out of the time that we're going to be there. Um, so we asked the question, um, and again, I think we're probably already doing everything we can. Marshall. Marshall, the Associated Press from me. It was a little hard seeing the charts um, with the screens. And, and I, I just want to clarify, what, are, what is the best estimate of the size of foam that came off? Could you just reiterate? And what, was that bigger than the foam that hit Columbia? Well, let me see. It's on the picture. I think that... And, I, and again, we're going to post these, so you're going to have this on the website. Uh, length, uh, total length was. Are you, which, which piece of thing? Uh, the power. I got that's picture number six. Uh, I'm like this. To, if you want to bring it back up. Okay. Um, again, uh, it's it's you got to understand first of all that this image could be foreshortened and it might be turned in some interesting ways, but the length there of the, of the thin part, the overall length, I think, is somewhere between 24 to 33 inches. The width of the thicker part is 10 to 14 inches. Um, and then uh, you can see, I, I call it width, it's length, okay. Width varies from uh, two and a half inches up to almost eight inches. Those guys are doing amazing things with what they got here. Um, they are also doing the same thing to the um, umbilical well picture, estimating sizes. So uh, that's the size. Um, my uh, read on this is this is somewhat smaller than the than the um, ET bipod ramp that came off. You know, Marcia, we ought to at least say though that this is the initial preliminary. Uh, assessment. These imagery guys can do wonderful things, and they're going to go off and continue to look at it and refine their their estimates. And when they get the better estimates, we'll bring that back, you know, in days to come. But but those are just the initial estimates. They are going to put exact measurements to it, and they will put a, a way to it before uh, before it's over. And, and and you're absolutely positive that this did not even scrape Nick 
side swipe discovery in any way? Uh, I can't say we're absolutely positive. The indications are that the, the um, video from the external tank um, walks uh, Bellows um, feed line camera, pardon me, showed that it did not, but uh, you, that's a very strong statement. Right. What we're going to do, I can guarantee you, is that we're going to look at the thermal protection system on the bottom of the orbiter tomorrow very closely, and uh, any damage will not detect our, uh, will not escape our detection, any significant damage. It went out of view very quickly, and uh, again, all indications are there were, there's no uh, damage to the orbiter, but that's why we got the future inspections that we're going to go do. I so we're going to get uh, John and then Guy, and then we'll go to the other NASA centers come back. John Johnson, Los Angeles Times. Uh, I think the CAVE report said something along the lines of that this vehicle is not inherently unsafe, a kind of a double negative. And um, given that you've just spent hundreds of millions of dollars in two and a half years to really bring this up to snuff and we have this happen again, is it time to maybe reconsider and say this vehicle is inherently unsafe and it's a miracle you can get it up and back safely? No. No. I mean, I, I don't... I, that's the most difficult question to answer when you sit there and put it the way you did. We think that this vehicle is safe, and we think we can fly this vehicle, and we think we can make this vehicle safe for the next flight. And and I just I guess the answer to that is no. We feel very very confident in our ability to make this vehicle safe. I mean, all the work that was done, and it's very impressive, and yet to have this happen again, uh, and to have as big a piece of foam come off as came off again. I mean. Doesn't that say something? It says we have more work to do. Yes. Guy uh, Guglielmo from the Washington Post. I guess uh, for either uh, Bill or Wayne, um, uh, can we understand that you have the results in from the RCC inspection today, and you've given me uh, bleeding edges, uh, a more or less clean bill of health at this point? Um, we, we did that inspection. You, uh, if you were watching the video today, you can clearly see that there were no big things, you know. Um, what we've got is the team going off and looking very closely for little things, which may not be obvious to the casual observer. Um, what I can tell you is that due to some technical problems, we don't have all the data on a couple of the panels, and we will be putting those back in the uh, focused inspection on flight day four. And um, so today we can't tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that uh, we've got a clean bill of health. I can tell you it's uh, virtually there, but we are not going to give you that assurance until we complete the work and we've got a little bit more work to do. Okay, let's go to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida for the questions we have down there. Dan Below, WESH-TV. Uh, question is, uh, of the two damage areas that you have, the one on the bipod and the one on the PAL ramp, uh, which one would you say is worse? In other words, which one's going to be harder to solve? Too early to tell. Um, I mean, me, none of those things that I showed you are satisfactory. And we're going to have to go out and solve all of them. Which one's going to be the most difficult, I think time will tell. You know, the only thing I would add is the failure mechanisms that you saw around the, around the bipod area are very well understood. And, and those will probably be very, very forthcoming on how we can, how we can make those kind of repairs. Uh, and, and, and fix that one. I, I think the power amp is going to be a little bit more, uh, just a little bit more difficult in that we, we don't understand the failure mechanism right now. I believe we will very soon, but at this current time, we're still evaluating that and we'll have to determine exactly what, what needs to be done to, to fix that. Hi, I'm Mark Kirkman, Interspace News. Um, it, with regard to the history of the power ramp, it's my understanding it's actually behaved pretty well. I just got a question uh, with regard to this particular one. Is there anything new about this ramp versus the others? And also, I know there was some spray-on uh, repair work done to the top end of that. Did that. The piece that disappeared from the power ramp, was it in that region or below that? Uh, no, the repairs that we did, we removed around the intertank flange area, the very top portion, about 10 feet of this power ramp up here at the top and did some repair work, some modification work on the intertank flange area underneath that and then replaced that. Where the damage occurred on this flight was 
a pretty good distance down below that, and we don't think there's any relationship in that whatsoever. And I can't remember what the first part of your question was. I think it had to do with had we done any repair work in that area, and I, I would tell you that folks are off pulling the build records and any repair records, and we did not have a report on that today. That's a part of uh, of an ongoing uh, you know investigation, uh, fault tree analysis that will go on, and and again that probably will take a little while. Kevin Oliver with WFTV in Orlando. I was just curious. Uh, what do you say to all the thousands of people who have been working on the space program to get the shuttle up to where it is after learning this today? And are you worried about morale now? Well, the, this is a pretty resilient group of people we work with, and they love what we do, and they and they want to make it safe. And uh, of course, they uh, they saw a beautiful launch uh, yesterday. Uh, On-orbit operations continue to go extremely well, as I said. And uh, and I think they uh, they would like, to, as Wayne said earlier, they would uh, we would like this to have been a perfect launch. We've got some things we've got to go work on, and we're going to go work on. Yes, uh, Shree Stott of the Palm Beach Post, uh, and I guess these are both for for Wayne. One, and the the PAL ramp, I understand, um, because of the oxygen feed line. Stuff coming off of there was probably not as likely to hit the orbiter as coming off the bipod ramp. Um, in your in your analyses in the last couple of years, could something coming off the power ramp have hit the orbiter? And uh, is something of this size that we saw could it have done some serious damage to the RCC? And then a, a more philosophical, long-term question: um, over, You mentioned that you wish that you had this some of this technology 25 years ago, 20 years ago. Do you think, and I know you've been around the program for a very long time, do you think there was more a question of not having the technology that you have today, or there wasn't the interest back then to get some of this data that obviously you have now? In terms of the first question, if this had come off earlier, we think that that would have been really bad. So it's not acceptable, okay? Um, second question, I think that people were very interested early on. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on understanding what the foam on the tank was doing in the uh, first few flights. Unfortunately, they didn't have some of the technical methods that we have here today to uh, get that data back. And so um, they had to do with uh, lesser capability. And uh, obviously, uh, we wish, that, and they probably then did too, that we had this better information. And, and well, one more, if I may. Um, the um, if you count this flight, this launch yesterday, it seems that three out of the four launches you've had, the last four launches have had large pieces of foam, uh, and the fourth flight was a night launch, I believe, and would have been difficult to see. Has there been? And again, I know you guys have looked at this for two years. It, was there a change done that it was something in common to the power ramp and the bipod foam that may have started this trend? Well, we've looked at that, and I, I, there's nothing that jumps out at us. We've we've reviewed it. We've uh, we've uh, ass done assessments on this, analysis on this. There's nothing that we can find that said this changed and caused this to happen. Um, so, I mean, obviously, uh, if we had found that, that would have been uh, something that we would have uh, told you about, and and, and then gone in the, and made the immediate changes to, and and maybe even kept uh, the design the way it was because it was a good design until we started seeing the fact that this phone could come off. Um, as far as, uh, you know, the reason we've committed to daylight launches and daylight ET separations is so we could go and observe this external tank. Uh, we did that for the for these uh, this first two flights. We may have to continue that for some time. I don't know. If, you know, we don't know all the parameters we'll place upon us. But, but the fact is, right now, that's exactly the reason we, uh, we put that constraint on us about the daylight launch and daylight external tank separation. Okay, let's go out to the West Coast Thames Research Center for a couple of questions there, please. Jessica Fortner with the San Jose Mercury News. Um, I was wondering 
uh, in terms of what the research centers uh, nationally are working on, if you could talk about what AIMS is involved in, specifically what simulations might the supercomputer be running and uh, how the ArcJet is, is testing thermal protection systems. Well, let's see, I would say that the, the number one, uh, and, and we've had a lot of support from the research centers around NASA, but the number one thing that Ames has done for us is the wind tunnel testing, which is, of course, the gold standard in any kind of aeronautical work to understand these complicated supersonic flow fields around the uh, external tank and the orbiter as they climb the orbit. Um, second, and, and immediately related to that, is the use of the supercomputers there for the computational fluid dynamics work which is which is taken uh, as its basis from the uh, wind tunnel test and extrapolated the information to uh, different flight regimes, which is uh, which is just a wonderful tool and and provided us a great deal of knowledge. We clearly have used the the the, uh, the uh, entry heating facility there uh, for many of our tests. Um, and uh, we have been calling on the engineers at the Ames Research Center to help us in a number of ways, uh, solving some of these very difficult engineering problems that we have getting this large uh, launch vehicle up into space. So it's been a huge effort. Uh, the other research centers, Glenn Research Center, Langley Research Center, um, uh, have been have been equally supporting the program. This has been a across the agency uh, team that has really helped us to uh, return the space shuttle to fly. You know, they're tied into the mission management team yes. briefings. Uh, they're prepared to uh, to go off and execute anything that we might need uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, currently, right now, I, I, I don't. I, I'm sure there are some data that they're providing to various groups within the within the program, but uh, I don't know of anything specifically that they're working on for this particular mission right right now. They they were a great uh, asset in building up to this, and they're they're standing by to help us in any way they can uh, if we if so needed. Uh, Tony Rusamano with KPIX TV in San Francisco. Simply stated, does this mean uh, shuttle flights are grounded? Well, until we fix this, we're we're not ready to go fly again. And so, I mean, uh, you know, if you can say that means we're grounded or whatever <laughs> whatever uh, terminals you want to use, but right now, until we understand this problem and until we're ready to uh, to say that we've fixed it and we're and we're, we can say that we're safe to go fly, and we're not going to go fly. Now, I, you know, I don't know if that's uh, uh, a month. Uh, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, three months. I don't know how long that is right now. So we've, we've got a lot of work to do in front of us to figure that out, and, uh, and we'll go do that. Thank you. Hi, either one of you gentlemen. This is Wayne Friedman with KGO TV in San Francisco. So you say you're grounded. You've spoken a little bit about your disappointment, but you certainly did not expect to be at this point after all of this work. Uh, one of your own people said that this would be the safest tank you have ever designed. Uh, I could give you the exact quote, and here you are today. Can, can you speak a little more about your level of disappointment and surprise by what has happened here? Well, let me see. Bill tried, tried before. Let me give it a shot. Perfection is our goal in this business. Um, you very seldom get perfection in anything that you do, and we uh, we need to do better than this. So um, we have a challenge ahead of us. Uh, we need to go fix it, and when we do, we'll go fly again. Um, if I got emotionally upset over every little speed bump along the way to fly in space, uh, you know, it would take a toll that you that you shouldn't take. I mean, um, it's the nature of the business, and if you're working in this business, you have to accept the fact that some days you're going to have to take a step back and redo the engineering. Um, and that's true not just of the shuttle, but of expendable launch vehicles. Our, our international partners uh, talk about very similar things. We had a, a really uh, a wonderful discussion with the uh, representative from the Japanese Space Agency that talked about their problems uh, to me at some length with their H-2 rocket launcher. Um, going into space is a very difficult thing. 
Um, and it's not to be undertaken lightly, and it's not for the faint of heart. And if you get disappointed every time that you have to go rework a problem, you probably need to find a different business to be in. You know, you have to admit when you were wrong. We, you know, we were wrong. We need we need to do some more work here. And so we're telling you right now, the, the bipod foam. I mean, the uh, the power ramp foam should not have come off. It came off. We we got to go do something about that. Okay, we're back here, down here on the front row for the final three or four. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll start back there, then we'll get these final three down front. Tag Fuji Television. I um, want to go back to the tile chip for just a second. Uh, it was estimated yesterday that that chip might be 1.8 inches in thickness. And if that is the entire thickness of the tile, it would seem like it was a bigger issue than you're, than you're treating it as. Can you explain that to me, please? Well, Okay, I, I didn't hear that estimate. I would tell you anybody to put out an estimate, you know, we don't know. And so I would say that that's an inaccurate number. Um, and, I, and I don't know where that came from. An inch and a half, you didn't say. The tile itself is 1.8 inches thick. Um, but I don't know anybody that's put out an estimate on the piece that came out. Get uh, Gina, then Kelly, then Tarek. Uh, Kirsten, sorry, ABC News. Wayne, I'm wondering, I'm anticipating a Wayne Hale memo to your employees tomorrow. What are you going to say to them? Oh, I the spirit hadn't moved me yet. I, I would tell them that we have a very important job ahead of us. We need to remain focused on this very complicated and ambitious space flight that is in progress to make sure that we uh, carry out the objectives that we have uh, that we have given ourselves on this flight. Um, we have three uh, spacewalks. Uh, we have to fix uh, control moment gyros. We need to resupply uh, the International Space Station. We have to put the um, the um, experiment, the ESP platform over on the International Space Station. Um, and we have to demonstrate that some of our uh, thermal protection system repair uh, techniques are good. And so we have a lot to do. And, and the message right now would be focused on the mission at hand. And, uh, and we'll deal with the rest of this as time goes by. More, we're getting a couple people that didn't ask a question. Kelly, then Tarek. New scientist for, I think, Bill. Um, since the aerodynamics folks said that you need that power ramp, what, what options are out there for you to, to redesign or rework it somehow? Well, as, as Wayne said, the Ames Research Center, we put the, the model into the tunnel. We got the data. We, we, uh, with, uh, with that, we have some instrumentation. We actually flew on this tank, and we'll get some more data back and, and understand, again, some of the, the aero loads and the thermal loads that are, are in that area. You know, it, I don't know exactly. Uh, Wayne mentioned some some other some fixes that he's heard about and, and have been talked about, but I will say it's in the beginning stages of a of a uh, design uh, modification. I will say that the the, uh, the we'll put a lot more emphasis on it now, and we're going to put a, a, some of our best people on it, and we'll we'll figure out something to do, and we may have to do something interimly, and then something long term. But uh, but again, uh, we need to. We need to get started on that, and, that'll, and that, that right now is, uh, is still in work. I mean, that's, we've had people looking at it, and they haven't really reported back to the program yet and said what are some of the options. They've just given us some, some thoughts, but, uh, but now they'll come back and give us uh, solutions. Yeah, I do need a question. Thank you. It's Tarek Malik with uh, Space.com and Space News. Just a clarification from Wayne. You mentioned that these, uh, these packages that you showed us uh, uh, have been uplinked to the, to the crew of the shuttle on the station. Uh, and I'm just curious because I know that uh, at least for the shuttle during their sleep period, does that mean that they've actually been notified directly or that they'll, they'll be as soon as they, uh, they wake up uh, at the next cycle? You know, that's that's going to be a really good question for Paul Hill. I, I know that Julie Payette uh, had a very brief conversation before the crew went to sleep yesterday. Uh, and frankly, I've been off in meetings today, and I, I have not monitored the air to ground completely to know what uh, what has been said. I do know they uplinked a lot of this information in, in uh, what we call the morning mail for the crew to look at. Um, and I expect that there will be some air-to-ground conversations about it, but I don't have that detail. I believe I talked to Tim Hominger, and he said that they had gotten the package, they had taken a look, and they, and they were very, very glad that, that we sent it up, and then they had talked about it just briefly, but there will probably be some more conversations about it. Okay, that's all the time we have. 
Es ist ein schwerer Rückschlag für die US-Weltraumbehörde NASA, auch wenn der beim Start der Discovery entstandene Schaden am Hitzeschild die Crew nicht gefährdet, zwingt der neue Zwischenfall zum Handeln. Alle anderen Space Shuttles bleiben am Boden, heißt es aus Houston. Vor dem nächsten Start müssten erst die technischen Probleme behoben werden. Für die Discovery soll heute vorerst alles nach Plan gehen. Sie dockt kurz nach 13 Uhr an der internationalen Raumstation ISS an. Die NASA hat viel zu erklären in diesen Tagen und die Nachrichten sind eher negativ. Zu viele Pannen mit der Discovery. Bis auf Weiteres wird keine Raumfähre mehr ins All geschickt. Wenn wir es vorher gewusst hätten, dann hätten wir Erneuerungen vorgenommen. Jetzt werden wir daran arbeiten und dann irgendwann wieder fliegen. Nach dem verheißungsvollen Start der Discovery dauerte es nicht lange, bis die Probleme auftauchten. Zunächst war ein Teil der Außentankisolierung abgebrochen. Ein Roboterarm untersuchte die Verkleidung der Discovery. Die Auswertungen dauern noch an. Doch damit nicht genug. Es löste sich außerdem noch eine Hitzeschildkachel in der Nähe des Fahrgestells. Ein wichtiger Baustein eines Shuttles, weil er beim Wiedereinstieg in die Erdatmosphäre vor der Hitze schützen soll. Beim Absturz der Columbia waren 2003 eben falls diese Teile beschädigt worden. Ein Absturz droht den Astronauten der Discovery nach Angaben der NASA aber nicht. Vielmehr gilt jetzt die Konzentration dem geplanten Andockmanöver mit der internationalen Raumstation ISS. Wenn es klappt, wäre es zumindest ein kleiner Erfolg für die Discovery. Ein schwacher Trost, denn schon jetzt steht fest, der Start der US-Raumfähre Atlantis ist auf unbestimmte Zeit verschoben worden. Die NASA steckt in einer Krise. A large piece of foam insulation broke away from the ship's fuel tank. This is exactly what happened to the Columbia shuttle back in 2003. Then the debris hit the shuttle's wing, causing catastrophic damage. This time NASA hopes and believes that the foam fell harmlessly into space. But it could have been very different and brought this stunning admission. We decided that it was safe to fly as is. Obviously, with the event that we've had, We were wrong. NASA is using 3D laser video to scan every inch of discovery to make sure there's no major problem which could jeopardize the shuttle during re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. The crew is staying upbeat, but they know that if there is a major problem, they may have to wait in the International Space Station for NASA to come up with Plan B. Even if the rest of this mission goes perfectly, the damage to the space program has already been immense. I personally am disappointed. Personally, I'm disappointed that we uh, had this happen. But on the other hand, uh, call it luck or whatever, I mean, it didn't harm the orbiter, and we learned something. This whole flight is about learning. And beyond. But what NASA is learning is that two and a half years of work and one billion dollars of investment has not solved the problem of insulation falling from their spacecraft. The whole shuttle fleet has now been grounded while they try to find a solution. And that could in effect spell the end of the shuttle program. Jeremy Cook, BBC News, Cape Canaveral. Sollte das Problem größer sein, müsste die Crew aussteigen und die Beschädigungen mit Spezialkleber und Spachtel selbst beheben. Wenn das nicht funktioniert, wird es für die Besatzung brenzlig, denn ein Ersatzshuttle steht wegen des verhängten Flugverbots derzeit nicht zur Verfügung. Ernüchterung macht sich breit, doch der NASA-Sprecher versucht sich in Zweckoptimismus. Ich bin persönlich sehr enttäuscht, dass dies passiert ist. Aber auf der anderen Seite, nennen Sie es Glück oder wie auch immer, die Raumfähre selbst ist nicht beschädigt. Und wir haben etwas daraus gelernt. Wir lernen viel bei diesem Flug. Natürlich haben die Besatzungsmitglieder das Schicksal ihrer Kollegen vor Augen. Beim Absturz der Columbia kam die gesamte Crew ums Leben. Auslöser, Schäden an den Hitzekacheln. Die großartige Fähre Columbia und ihre tolle Crew. Wir vermissen sie und wir führen ihre Mission fort. Der Flug der Discovery, eine riskante Mission mit ungewissem Ausgang. Aus Norweg, aus den Niederlanden zugeschaltet, ist uns jetzt Dieter Isakait von der NASA. Er ist ESA-Manager. Herr Isakait, wie schwerwiegend ist denn das Problem, das die NASA offensichtlich hat? 
Ja, das werden die nächsten Tage zeigen. Was passiert ist, ist, dass sich ein Stück Schaum von der Außenhaut des Tanks gelöst hat. Der Tank wird ja abgeworfen, also der Tank ist sowieso nicht mehr am Shuttle. Und wie es aussieht, ist dieses Schaumstoffstück auch an der Unterseite des Shuttles vorbeigeflogen, ohne irgendwelchen Schaden anzurichten. Also es sieht aus, als wenn das Shuttle selber davon nicht betroffen ist und seine Mission auch nicht gefährdet ist. Aber möglicherweise sind äh, Missionen der ESA gefährdet, beziehungsweise äh, die Teilnahme. Thomas Reiter sollte ja bei der nächsten Mission am 9. September dabei sein, mit der Atlantis dann äh, ins All starten. Äh, sehen Sie da noch Chancen, dass diese Mission noch zustande kommen kann? Ja, das haben wir eben von den NASA-Managern ja gehört, dass äh, kein Flug stattfindet, bevor äh, das Problem geklärt ist. Äh, man muss sagen, dass dieser Flug und auch noch der nächste Flug mit Thomas äh, Reiter als Testflüge gelten, um die verschiedenen Maßnahmen, die man getroffen hat, um das Shuttle sicherer zu machen, äh, zu testen und falls tatsächlich noch Probleme auftreten, diese zu reparieren. Also es ist nicht so, dass man geflogen ist und geglaubt hat, es ist alles in Butter. Das Shuttle hat einen Reparatursatz dabei. Die Astronauten könnten also gegebenenfalls sogar Löcher stopfen, richtig spachteln, so wie man das zu Hause an Wänden macht. Also die Missionen sind sowieso dafür da, um herauszufinden, ob was passiert ist und wie, wie schwerwiegend das ist. Also das müssen wir jetzt den NASA-Ingenieuren überlassen, in den nächsten Wochen festzustellen, äh, ob weitere Maßnahmen notwendig sind oder ob es etwas ist, was immer passieren kann. Also wir sind nicht der liebe Gott, hundertprozentige Sicherheit gibt es nirgendwo. Aber trotz alledem wirbelt ja dieser Zwischenfall jetzt auch Ihre Zeitpläne bei der AESA ordentlich durcheinander. Was heißt das für die Zukunft der ESA, für Ihre Pläne? Ja, das Problem ist, die NASA hat sich selber auferlegt, nur unter ganz bestimmten Bedingungen das Shuttle zu starten, also bei Tageslicht und auch bei Tageslicht in den wichtigen Flugphasen. Das führt dazu, dass man im Moment relativ selten starten kann. Wir sprechen da von Startfenstern. Wir sind gerade in einem Startfenster, was am 31., also am kommenden Sonntag, zugegangen wäre. Das nächste Startfenster eröffnet sich am 9. September für etwa zwei Wochen und da sollte Thomas Reiter sein. Wenn dieser, der, der Flug nicht in diesem Startfenster stattfinden kann, dann öffnet sich ein größeres Startfenster erst wieder im nächsten März. Also wenn der nächste Flug verpasst wird, wird man mehrere Monate nicht mehr fliegen können. Herr Isakait, wir kriegen jetzt gerade Live-Bilder von der NASA und äh, aus dem All und da sehen wir, dass der äh, Tank offenbar jetzt abgetrennt wurde. Ist das jetzt äh, im normalen Zeitplan vor dem Andocken? Wie können Sie das beurteilen, ohne dass Sie jetzt die Bilder äh, sehen? Ja, ich kann mir vorstellen, welche Bilder Sie sehen. Äh, der Tank wird nach, äh, im Aufstiegflug äh, nach wenigen Minuten bereits abgeworfen und die Bilder, die Sie jetzt wahrscheinlich sehen, sind Aufnahmen, die von der Crew an Bord des Shuttles gemacht worden sind, als sich der Tank von ihnen entfernte. Und darauf sieht man, dass ein Stück äh, Schaumstoff äh, fehlt. Also das ist das Normale. Der Tank ist abgesprengt worden, weil er gerade in der Flugphase war, wo er abgesprengt worden ist. Also das sind die Bilder, aus denen man jetzt entnommen hat, dass ein großes Stück abgefallen ist und wo das abgefallen ist. Vielen Dank, Herr Isakait von der ESA in den Niederlanden. So, und wie gesagt, wir halten Sie auf dem Laufenden heute, den ganzen Morgen, Vormittag über und vor allem dann sind wir live dabei beim Andock-Manöver um 13.18 Uhr soll es soweit sein und wir berichten in einer Sondersendung ab 13 Uhr.